Perfect. Hello and welcome to Fire in the Belly. Today we have myself, Mighty Pete, and we're joined by the Christopher Roche. Good afternoon. Or good evening. Where are we? Good afternoon. Yes. <laughs> we're transatlantic, so that's always a good start to the day, right? Right on, man. Yeah, here it's uh almost it's one o'clock in the afternoon. I think there it would be about eight o'clock at night. We're nine o'clock, yeah. Yeah. So nine o'clock. We're getting into the the deep the deep dark hours. I like it. I like it. So listen, <laughs> welcome to the show, Christopher. Tell us who are you? What are you doing? Where are you from? Ah, uh, let's see. I am Christopher Roush. What do I do? Uh, I inspire people to be different. And where am I from? Southern California. <laughs> and what, why, why be different? Why be different? Um, honestly, Pete, because I've spent most of my life trying to be somebody I wasn't to make people like me. And I find being yourself, being unique is really the, way, the best way to be in life because when you're congruent with that, your energy changes, your outlook shifts, your stress level goes down, your happiness level goes up, and you look forward to just being yourself instead of having to put on the proverbial mask that we've had to wear most of our lives to try to make other people like us. So uh, I say fly your freak flag, be who you are. And, uh, you know, there's 7 billion people on the planet. You're going to find your group. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> simple, simple. So, do people like you more now that you are who you, you truly are or do they like you more before? Uh, great question, Pete. You know, actually they like me more the way I am now. I would have to say that there's, there's probably some people who don't because God's honest truth. <clears throat> when I started off in, in motivational speaking and coaching, I was the suit and tie guy. I didn't have the bandana tie guy looking like everybody else, sounding like everybody else doing the little hand pose thing. And <clears throat> And then all of a sudden I came off stage one day and I looked, I was at a big event and there was just, everybody else was wearing suit and ties. We were all saying the same thing. Everybody was trying to sell stuff. It just, it just didn't seem right to me for what I wanted to do with personal development. I actually really want to help people. I really want to connect with people. And I uh, decided to join a mastermind and find out what my niche was. Cause I never knew what my niche was. I was trying to make everybody like me. I was trying to help everybody. I just, I love everybody. I'm it's just my nature. And uh, I joined a mastermind group group. And I was like, I'm just, I think I have to be like this. And like, Chris, why don't you just be you? What would it be like if you were just you? And I was like, well, I would probably swear a little bit. I probably wear my hat or my bandana or something like that because I hate sweating. Uh, I would probably wear jeans and a t-shirt and my Vans tennis shoes and just be me. And the, everybody in the mastermind was like, well, why don't you do that? And I'm like, because people sit there and think that you have to fit into this box and, da, 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 da. and just through that conversation. And people were like, no, you could be you. And when I started being me, Pete, uh, it was interesting. Some people like, you know, Chris, you shouldn't swear in social media. You shouldn't swear. You're a speaker. You're a coach. You don't want to, oh, okay. You're right. And then I started like being small again, like, oh, I don't want to swear and make somebody upset. And it's like, it's just a word, you know, it really is just a word. So um, the long and the short of it is yes, more people do really like me for where I am now because I've attracted so many other people in this world because I was ex corporate. I was in corporate for over 26 years. I just left the corporate position of 26 years last November. And through this process, through COVID and everything else, I've really learned to trust who I am and to be who I am authentically. And it's crazy because people are seeing me like, dude, you're so happy. And you're so hyper and you want to look, how do I do that? So people are actually coming to me for coaching, saying that they're comfortably miserable in their day job or they're comfortably miserable in whatever it is. And they just want to be who they are because they hear me talk about the regrets, right? The top five regrets of the dying. One of it is that you lived your life uh, pleasing everybody else and not pleasing yourself. And so I've really learned that regrets in my life uh, are, are, I'm really trying to avoid them. So just being me, yeah, I've attracted more people. And I've actually changed people's perspective about, you know, cussing or just being yourself and that you can do it. And it's not all about money and ego and everything else. So, and, and, um, and making them happy has, has been awesome. So how long, how long have you had the, you know, collapse the gap then between, you know, who you were and who you truly are now? That has been, that has been an ongoing journey since about 2013. Before that, I was still me, but there was like, it was like going back to the mass situation. Like, okay, when I go to work, I have to be this guy. I have to be the leader. I have to be the business guy. I have to be this, you know, I can't really argue and debate something um, that I know is right if I actually want to be happy. So, and then I had the mask, like, okay, when I go home, I have to be this person. I want to hang out with these people. I have to do that. Um, so over that journey, I've really just learned to embrace, but over this year and leaving my corporate position of 26 years where I was comfortably miserable, uh, and just free falling into who I am and being that light for so many other people who are miserable, pretending to be something they're not, they're in miserable relationships, they're in miserable work where people are miserable and they're just doing it to themselves. Um, so this last, you know, seven months, eight months, I've just been me and it's been awesome. 
comfortably miserable. I think a few people might uh, might just be able to relate with that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I came up with that. I came up with that phrase not too long ago, honestly, because I was thinking about my day job, made great money, had great benefits, great team, blah, blah, blah. And like they talk about in the book behind me, um, the, the biggest leap, he talks about you operate in your zone of excellence or you operate in your zone of genius. Those are the two highest level tiers. And I was operating in my zone of excellence as a leader. I have a master's degree in organizational management. Business is like second nature to me. I can do it in my sleep. No big deal. But my zone of genius is where I help connect people and I help people overcome their self-created crap without the self-help fluffy bullshit that I can connect with people and get them to adjust their perspective about their past and their present and their future and get them to see that life is happening for them and not to them. That is my zone of genius. I have, I've had so many coaching clients and so many coaching calls that I've offered for free during this time to help people out. And it's amazing, Pete, how many people are sabotaging their own success, their own happiness for stupid, stupid reasons um, that they're just not aware of. Isn't it funny how people self-sabotage, and especially at this time when there's a lot of change going on around us, right? You know, it's a, it's a weird old time. Mm -hmm. Yep, it, it, it truly is. It's, mm -hmm. I've asked so many people in the last six or eight months, uh, I'm like, okay, I want you to answer this question without even thinking about it. And I, I just want you to answer it honestly. And I'll say, and depending on what the situation, one of the questions that I ask is, do you love yourself, yes or no? And I am surprised I am and I'm not. I'm, I'm surprised at how many people really don't love themselves. And then you start digging into that and you ask why and you realize it's old beliefs that have been instilled in us from our childhood, from our parents and from our teachers and from society and from everything else that we trusted and believed in. And then we're sent off into the world. We're never given the tools, Pete, to understand emotional intelligence, to understand how to process and manage emotions, how to reframe things in our life to work for us and not against us. And our parents think they did the best they could and everybody did the best they could. And then we're kind of off in the world and we have to figure it out for ourselves. So getting people to have that perspective shift and being able to love themselves and appreciate themselves uh, is, is massive, is massive in letting go of the baggage and, and all this stuff that has happened in their life and giving it a different meaning and having empathy and forgiveness for ourselves, for the things that we may have done when we were stupid and innocent. You know, it's, it's crazy what you can get out of forgiveness for yourself and for other people. You don't have to forget but it's truly, it's truly inspiring when you can sit there and reframe something that was really negative and bad and horrible and whatever you want. Cause I've had every experience literally almost, I think. Um, and, and being able to reframe that and go back and help other people taking your trash and making it your treasure has been something that I've been fired up for, for most of my life, given the, the situations that I went through when I was younger. That's cool. I mean, what would you say? Do you, do you like yourself? Do you love yourself? Oh, do you value yourself? Yes. Yes, I'm a work in process. There are aspects of myself that frustrate me still to this day. Uh, and everything else that I've been through in my life. Yes, I do love myself. I respect myself. I know I deserve great things in this life. I know I don't have to constantly prove myself to other people to get validation and get significance, which is something that I have been guilty of since I was a little kid. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. My work in progress, always. We should always be a work in progress. But from where I was to where I am, massive difference. Cool. So tell us, what does what Fire in the Belly mean to you, Christopher? Fire in the Belly mean, I love that, that, that show title, man. I really, really do. Fire in the Belly means you have grit. It means you have swagger. It means you have energy and passion. It means you're willing what's right and what's fair. And that's when I wrote my eulogy years ago, the ending of my eulogy was, is that Christopher Roush will have fought for what was, what was right and what was fair. He will have risked for which that mattered and he will have left the earth a better place for who he was and what he did. So when I think about fire in the belly, my fire in my belly is helping people um, get out of their own way, especially helping kids, helping our youth, helping our at-risk youth. I've been a mentor for at-risk kids for many, many, many years now because I was one of those at-risk kids going off and doing stupid things out on the streets and everything else. Um, so having a fire in your belly just means there's a conviction in there that you know is true to your heart and, and your mission in life to to have an impact on it. So a fire in the belly, like about homelessness or about mental health or about stupidity or whatever else that might be. I have a, I have a passion in my life for help, helping people not be stupid to themselves. Uh, so that's, that's what I really gain out of that. It's just a, it's a, it's an energy. It's a, um, but I'm interested to hear what your, what your vision for fire in the belly really was or is, or if that captures it. Yeah, it's, it's all that. I mean, it's, listen, I, I believe as long as you have a, a sort of a beat in your heart and a, and a breath in your lungs, it's, I believe everyone has it. You could be having the best day, you could be having the worst day. And I, I believe it's kind of like, listen, there's diamonds hiding inside you. 
And I believe that's, you know, you're firing your belly and, and that's, it's just there to come out, you know, whether you choose to let it out or not. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the concept is listen, we're all different. Thank God. Jesus. Uh, you, can you imagine if we're all the same the world would be a pretty whacked out place? <laughs> So. It would be boring. It would be so boring, Pete. I mean, that's what people, some of the stuff going on here in the U S elections and everything else. And you got people jumping off of Facebook and Twitter going to where, where they can all agree and not be censored and not have, and like, why do you want to go in a place where everybody agrees with you? That's, that's ridiculous. You should be looking for people to counter your arguments, not be dicks about it. But you know, I want to have that conversation with somebody that says, Hey, Chris, I can see what your point is. However, have you considered this? You know, there's certain ways to have a conversation and be able to eloquently say something to somebody that, you know, we do need our eyes open. And if we're walking around saying, oh, I have the answers and whatever that person tells me isn't true, or that's a lie, that's a ridiculous way to live because all that's going to do is create groupthink. All it's going to do is, is create stations and, you know, iron sharpens iron. And, and I love to have that conversation with people who say, hey, what about this? What about that? And, and people sometimes don't like it because it makes them feel uncomfortable. It questions their confidence, um, you know, questions their intelligence sometimes. But if you want to go have those silo conversations, then go for it. But for me, I want you, un- I want unity, but I want, uh, to be able to have that conversation and respect that. Hey man, you're totally different than mine. Awesome. Cool. You could go pick whatever president you want. You're still a good person. Awesome. Let's have a conversation about anything else, but that you're still a good person. Um, so that plays out now, especially in the politics here in, in, uh, the United States and then COVID around the world. Yeah, why is it, I mean, is it, is it, what is it, a, like a threat to your values or what is it that gets people, they can't just back off a bit and say, listen, yeah, your opinion's your opinion's mine's mine and that's cool, I respect you for being human and cool and that's it. Why do we have to take it to another level? Um, honestly, it goes back to our childhood. It goes back to our defense mechanisms and, and being told when we're kids, you know, when you're right, when Christopher's right, Christopher gets presents and Christopher gets accolades and that bad grade or did something in school. Oh, you did something wrong. Okay. So now I have to tell you why you're wrong. Now you have to be punished why you're wrong. Now you, there's a perceived loss of love when you're wrong. So if you're in an argument still as, a, as an adult, there's still, we're still little kids inside. Pete. I mean, I firmly believe that I go into coaching situations now and I, I'm like trying to find out who that person is, is a little kid or a little girl, a little boy or a little girl and trying to figure that out. So when you sit there and you come across, you know, what it is, is they perceive it as authoritarian. Like, oh, this reminds me of what my mom used to tell me when I did something wrong. And so it excites those emotions. Really, mom, I'm going to prove you wrong. You know, this is my chance to get you back because you're a perception of my mom. I did the same thing. I was like, why am I triggered by some of these people? I'm like, they remind me of my mom. I'm like, okay, now what I have to do is mentally I have to reassociate how I see other people because those people are not my mom. And so then I started reading books and like, okay, how do you understand that? How do you separate those expect expectations? Um, but quite literally, it just, it's, it's a throw to the throw to the, uh, to their confidence. And quite honestly, also Pete, and I'd like to know your thoughts on this. People have, people nowadays don't communicate very, very well. Have the emotional intelligence, the, the, the ability to have a conversation, to ask probing questions, you know, to seek first to understand, then to be understood. We're in this digital age now where we want to know the answers. We, we want to interrupt people. We want to finish their sentence, but really having a great conversation and saying, hey, listen, Pete, what do you think about this? And listening and going, hey, Pete, you know, so here's what I heard you say. Da, da, da. Okay, wow, that person heard me. That person understands me. Good. Okay, now let them speak. Let me listen to them. Have a conversation. Um, everybody's just really self-defensive right now. And it's, it's because tensions are high and people aren't being congruent with who they really want to be in their life. And uh, there's a lot of pain going on in the world. Yeah, it's, it is. It's crazy, crazy times. I mean, I think you're, you're, you know, you're, you're onto something there and that's, that's kind of where, depending on your, your interview style and things like that, nice that people come on the show, we, you know, it's about you, you know, it's, it's your, your journey, your thing. Um, you know, cause I'm running a theory and I'm actually doing a Ted talk and a TEDx talk in uh, January and the title being is be heard awesome. or be heard or die, you know, and it's, um, you know, it's a little bit, you know, it's, it's a bit clickbaity, obviously, in the title, but um, the point simply being is, you know, if you don't get your message out in the right way, then, yeah, a little bit of you is going to die. You're kind of going, yeah, I, I, I could have done that, but yeah, it didn't really happen. And you can just hear that just die, just, you know, another little bit just goes and the disappointment and it. everything else, you know. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I mean, what, what flipped the switch for you then? And, you know, you're sort of, you're talking about 26 years in corporate and then, you know, yeah, here you are now. It's uh, you're far from corporate. Yeah, <laughs> I'm far from corporate. And, and, you know, honestly, sometimes I do miss it. 
Uh, but it was never, it was like a, a, a semi round peg trying to get into a round hole. I mean, I was there. Uh, I could have easily played the game. I could have easily been hugely successful. I could have easily job jumped and become a president of a company, which was my original goal after I got my master's degree. But there was just, there was always that congruency part. It was like, I can't be who I am. And that bugs me. And that bugs me. So why am I doing something that it doesn't allow me to be who I am? Because it's comfortable, because it's safe, because of the situation that I've been in when I was younger, I, I've always been in survivor mode. And up until last year, when my coach, the amazing Sally Anderson from down in New, New Zealand, um, you know, hit me up and we became, we became partners, you know, there was one point in the process. And quite honestly, Pete, I was a little, I was a little arrogant because I'm a really good coach, but in to, for somebody to coach me, it takes a lot. And this woman was just absolutely amazing. And she goes, and I'm going I'm to apologize a little bit, but she would, she would just say, fuck mate. She goes, you're in survivor mode. Stop fucking being in survivor mode. I'm like, Sally, I'm not in survivor mode. I'm not, I'm not in survivor mode anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm successful. I have two houses. I'm, I'm good. I'm not in survivor mode. She goes, yes, you are. Yes, you are. And I'm like, how? And she goes, bam, 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 bam. She succinctly gave me like four examples. And I went, and rather than being, I was like, hmm, hmm. I didn't think of it that way. And that's what most people don't say is like, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, not. And I kind of did that, but I was like, you know what? Shut up and listen, Chris, this lady's smart. You know, this is why you have coaches, why you have people in your life, accountability partners, you know, to, to love you so much that I'm going to tell you that you're, what you're doing, what you're saying is sabotaging your success. And, and that's what best friends should be. That's what, that's what real, that's what real people should be for each other is when somebody says, you know, do I look fat in these pants? Your friends should go, yeah, you do. Let's go, let's go jog. Let's go join a membership. You know, what do you want to do with your life? You know, do you want to, you come on, you should be, you should be honest. And if that person sits there and say, oh, well, don't be honest. Well, don't ask fucking questions. You don't want answers to. I tell people that all the time. I'm like, they'll ask me a question. I'm like, how bad do you want the answer on a scale of one to 10? Being an honest answer. And they'll be like, mm, seven. I'm like, okay, then why'd you ask the question? If you only want an answer on a seven, you should only ask a question that you want an answer of a 10. I mean, very, be very intentional with your questions because I'm staring at 18 questions in front of me. I've been creating this list. I'm, I'm, I'm on the, I'm on a quest. I love questions. And as an, I'm, I'm looking for like the 20 best questions in life that can really get us to where we need to be. And it's just really about the questions we ask ourselves. Am I happy? Yes or no? No, there's not a, maybe there's not a somewhat you either are, or you aren't. And for me looking at that in the corporate career to make a long story long, um, it just wasn't me and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the politics and everything were changing. It was a privately owned company before, it was family, it was cool. We had, we had um, flexibility. And then when we got uh, bought out by the private investor group, things became more political, more, oh, you have to write your emails like this. I'm like, I write books. Um, I, can, I don't need any help writing an email after 26 years of doing it. Uh, but then it started being like that. And I'm like, you know what? And I started bringing that home and really looking at my legacy, Pete. And, and that's one of the biggest things I teach people is when you know where it is that you want to be and what you want to be remembered for, um, and you hold yourself accountable to a promise you keep to yourself to be congruent and to live that life and to be remembered that way, you can't sabotage yourself anymore. And I, I knew, I knew that eventually it was going to happen. Um, I think it was part of my strategy in a, in a weird, sick kind of way. I knew that it wasn't going to last forever. And they came to me and they said, Hey, listen, you know, we want to eliminate your position. And I had already talked about this two years before as a, as a, as a business recovery plan. I'm like, you guys, if we ever get into the situation, here's what we could do. So they, they parted out my responsibilities to two people that I had hired and trained, which was great. It made me feel good. And I left. And at first, honestly, Pete, the identity part of it was, was super challenging because going from being known as this person and having this identity and this credibility and these relationships overnight to not having that anymore is really devastating. I'll be honest. It was, it was quite a shock for me to go from thinking that I had some of these relationships and friendships over the years. And I'd done so much to help these people and help this organization and the way they treated me, I was bitter and I was frustrated for a little bit, but like I tell everybody else, you can be bitter or better. And I'm like, you know what? And I started asking myself, this could be the best thing that ever happened in my life. And this is very shortly there afterwards. I mean, I do a lot of quick work on myself. I'm like my own best coaching client. And I started refocusing. I'm like, Chris, this is a gift. And then when COVID hit, I was like, my son couldn't go to school anymore. So now I got to spend time with my son. Before I was, I was away from the house 98% of the time. Now I'm at home 98% of the time. What can I do? Okay, this is not a reason. This is, this is the reason. This is a sign for you to do your coaching and your speaking full time now. I did them simultaneously for many, many, many years, probably 15 years. 
I did speaking and coaching. I just, I would take a vacation. I would go speak somewhere or go coach somewhere. I do a retreat somewhere and I come back and I'd still have my corporate job. Um, but ultimately you can't expect to live that way and be healthy for the rest of your life. If you're doing shit that doesn't make you happy. So, and it wasn't making me happy in that, that core sense. And I just said, you know what? I need to refocus. And there have been times where I'm like, you know what? Maybe I should go back and get a job, da, 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 da. But no, no, there's this, there's this video. And, and, and this is really important. I don't know if you've ever seen the Steve Harvey, uh, comedian guy, talk show host guy. He has a video called jump. It's on YouTube. I probably recommended that video kid you not probably 10,000 times in the last seven video. And in that video, I'll paraphrase. And I, my coach made me watch this. She made me watch that video and she made me watch a Bob Newhart video from way back when. And I'll tell you about that one. But the jump video really, Steve says, and it's just, just somebody filming him on a cell phone. He's like, Hey guys, he goes, you're looking at everybody and you're seeing people soar. You're seeing people happy. You're seeing people take vacations. You're seeing people like live in their life. And you're like, why are they doing that? Well, they jumped. Right. And he's like, okay, so you're going to jump. Yeah. It's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to scratch your back up. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get dinged. Your parachute's not going to open right away. You're going to wonder if you made the wrong decision. You're going to blah, 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 blah. He goes, but guess what? He goes, eventually your chute will open. Your chute will open. You're going to be able to start flying. You're going to be starting doing this and that. But he's, he ends and he goes, he goes, but if you don't jump, your chute will never open. And I was like, bam, jaw drop. Holy shit. Wow. That stung me. I've watched so many motivational videos and seen so many things. That two minute video, I tell people, I watch it all the time. I'm like, just keep jumping. You're going to figure it out. We're resourceful people. And that's what this life is really about is, is to test us to get out of the comfort zone and get us out of our excuses. That's why I'm called the no excuses coach and really push ourselves outside of our comfort zone. I'm not sure if you're aware of a guy named David Goggins. Have you ever heard of David Goggins? No, I'm well. So I studied that guy. I studied that guy before I had back surgery last year. I had major back surgery back in January of 2019. And somebody had turned me on to, I'm like, wow, I want this kind of perspective as I go through back surgery and think about physical therapy afterwards and think about everything else. I want to have this mindset. Like this guy looks forward to, you know, going through the pain and the punishment. I think it's a little excessive for me personally. I know people are trying to aspire to do that. I don't want to walk. I don't want to run 26 miles on bloody feet and broken toenails. I'm not that kind of a psycho. Respect them for doing that good for you. But at the same time, it's just really about having that mental fortitude to look forward to climbing those mountains, right? You know, so many people want like, what can I do to get to the top of mountains? I have that majestical view that I'm going to take in for five minutes. Well, that climb up that mountain, Pete is struggling. You know, you're climbing. Oh man, this is hard. Oh, I need some water. Oh, my legs hurt. Oh, my back hurts. Oh, this is taking forever. And then what happens when you get to that view and you turn around and you go, oh. what do you say? Oh, wow. This is worth it. Yeah. So the two hours of skinning your hands up and your knees and you're climbing your rock, but you get up there and the view's worth it. So then that's the, that's the, that's the analogy I use for life. I'm like, okay, you've reached those summits before. Yes. Oh, I have. Yeah. Did it, did it hurt? Did it suck? Yeah. Okay. Was it worth it? Yeah. Okay. Guess what? There are so many more mountains you're going to climb in your life. You have that perspective. Like, yeah, I'm going to go tackle it. And it, and, and it's not going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. There's going to be opportunities. I talk a lot about the words that we use and the phrases that we use that really can stop us or propel us into what it is that we want to do. So I look at that as an opportunity for me to grow. Okay. I'm going to face this mountain. I'm going to go grow from this. And I'm going to get to that, that peak. And I'm going to see that. I'm going to look back down and go, damn Christian again. And that's what I encourage for everybody to do. So many people are wasting their intelligence, their brilliance, their light, everything. They're wasting it, playing the Sunday game, hoping, wishing, and praying that this and that happens and that lines up. And I just saw somebody do it today. I was talking about writing my book and she's like, oh yeah, I've been thinking about it. I'm like, if you keep thinking about it, you're going to die and it's never going to happen. Just start writing, write 10 words a day for the rest of your life. You're going to write your book. You know, somehow you're going to get there. Um, so I can't remember exactly what the, the question was, Pete. I think it was something about corporate and leaving, but ultimately you just, you have to do what is in, and some people don't even know what they're firing the belly. And that's half the battle too, is just knowing what it is that they want to accomplish. Mm. That's so true. It is, it is true. Not everyone knows. And I mean, I recognize that people sort of die, die being okay. You know, it's like, how are you? Yeah, I'm okay. All right. Okay. You know, but as you say, I, I, I love that sort of, that del that's, clarification question do you love yourself do you like yourself do you value yourself and then as you say the number of people that can't answer it that's it can be quite heartbreaking you know it's it's it quite it's so so telling it take is. us back I mean, about christopher 
who um, talk to us about mini mini Christopher? What was that? Sorry, talk talk to us about mini Christopher. Mini Christopher, mm. my son or little me? L little you, little me. Uh, in what capacity? You tell me. How how oh, was it? If we were to meet, meet meet many of you. What would we have met? Jeez, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Thank you. I told you to ask me anything. Uh, mini me. Um, it all depends. I mean, honestly, I was a uh, I was a kid that was born who never knew his biological father. Uh, my biological father was married and had a family of his own, and my mother was promiscuous. So I was born into that situation. I was actually supposed to be placed for adoption when I was born. But my mom said that she, uh, the nurse came over and said, do you want to see him? And she said, I guess so. And they placed me on top of her. And I, apparently she said, she looked at me and she's like, okay. And she already had my sister. Um, and she said, it's just you and me kid. And that is actually oddly enough, the title of my book that I'm writing right now that my other coach and my other mentor said, Chris, that book is the thing that is going to be your launching pad. You have to get it done. And honestly, Pete, it's something that I've avoided writing because it is the intimate journey of my story with my mom. And we grew up in Los Angeles, California, a very, very bad part of Los Angeles called Inglewood. So I learned about discrimination and being different at a very young age. I was one of the only white kids in a black neighborhood. Um, mom had various psychological disorders, uh, alcohol dependencies, uh, things going on with her. And then she also had my sister who was by another father uh, who she was previously married to. So it was just a lot of chaos and turmoil. Um, and my mom dealing with all those different types of psychological factors. And so when I was a little boy, I was very independent. Um, I was very lonely. And I always wanted was attention. And obviously getting into motivational speaking and speaking on stage and doing, I'm like, oh, where can I get more attention? Ooh, this is fun. You know, that whole story has, has been, has been eye-opening as well as to why I wanted to do that originally. Um, but who was little, little Chris? Um, throughout his life, he was bullied. He adulthood very young. Uh, my therapist asked me a long time ago, she said, Chris, when did you stop being a kid? And it was interesting because I didn't really care for that therapist. Most of the therapists that I'd been to up in slap point fee session, which was kind of fun. It was like, ah, I'm okay. I got to fix you. You know, it was kind of funny. But, uh, but when she asked me that question and I've hung on to that question, like I said, I love questions. Like, when did you stop being a kid? And I was like, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I was like, mm, a real kid, probably seven or eight years old. I said, I was a latchkey kid. Um, I was bullied. I was bullied. You know, I had physical, emotional, spiritual abuse from my mom. Uh, I got bullied by the neighborhood kid. I got bullied by kids at school and didn't have any self-confidence, didn't have a father around to teach me how to fight for myself. Uh, didn't know what was up. I had some really good friends as kids, as kids do that got me through that. But, um, yeah, I loved playing with cars. Uh, really what I wanted most when I was a kid was a family. I wanted love. I wanted what everybody else seemed to have that I was missing and God's honest truth. Now, Pete, I wouldn't trade any of it, any single situation that happened in my life, any belief, anything that I did. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything because it's made me the person I am today. And because I chose to go through that and I chose to get stronger and I chose to read personal development books and, and look at who was successful and who's not successful and look for the patterns and just keep how to be unstoppable. They ask me all the time, like, how do you, how do you become unstoppable, Chris? And they think it's some sort of huge thing. I'm like, I don't stop. I put one foot in front of the other. I may have a couple of days or a couple of weeks, even a couple of months. Sometimes a couple of years ago, I did, I was like, nah. I was like all pissy poo poo, not very motivational. And I was like, you know what? I think I need to sit in this. I think this is happening for me. I need to figure out what this is about and I'm going to get through it one way or another. And I'm going to figure out how to pivot from this. But right now I kind of need to go through this gook to make me grow and, and more realize more stuff about myself. So I'm not sure if that answered that, but uh, little Chris grew up into big Chris and now little Chris still inside of me is, is finding ways to play, to find and reconnect with that little kid through my son, uh, through um, a group coaching program that we're doing. I'm doing with a buddy of mine where, where one of the things we did was like, okay, let's go play. Let's go play. We stop playing. We stop having being adventurous. We stop being curious. We stop being, you know, limitless um, because eventually the adults in our life say, Oh, listen, no. Oh, don't dream too big or, or, Oh, that's not realistic. And they put all these kiboshes on us. They tell us that anything's possible. You can be anything. And then it comes to a point where you're five years old and they go, yeah, but that, but that, but that, but that, but I want you to be this. And I want you to be that. And I want you to act like that. And I want you to do this. And then you go through life and you go, Oh, I got to do whatever everybody else tells me to do. And then you get to 50 years old and you kind of go, man, I don't want to keep doing this shit. So yeah. What about you? 
Hey, who's Little Pete? Little Pete. Little Pete was a quiet, sort of self-contained sort of a chap. Uh, generally happy to get out of school. You know that. Uh, you know, I don't know many people running into school. It's um, different, but fairly shy. You know, but doing a lot of regression stuff recently and uh, a lot going on, early childhood memories and even in the womb, which is a bit bizarre, Ooh. but uh, yeah, it's kind of all the regression and past lives and all sorts of crazy stuff. Hey, it's, listen, it's amazing when you meet people through the show and things like that, you never know what journey you're going on to, you know, and, and I'm sure you know yourself. I mean, with every guest, you learn something, you hear something, you do something and it's kind of going, yep, I didn't expect this to happen. <laughs> and there we go. We're, we're going sp spiritual, we're going deep, we're going religious and as you say, listen, respect everyone's opinion, but you can't help but pick up stuff, right? On the way, you know, you, you do learn. I love it. I love you know, everything you just said, Pete. Is I mean, I've been I've been interviewing and doing broadcasting now for geez, at least five years. I had a podcast. I had a I had a live radio show for two and a half years, and then now I've been doing my podcast, Ron, and so after that, and then I also do two other shows. So I've I've interviewed a lot of people, and you're right. You know, it's crazy meeting somebody virtual. I've met so many people virtually this year, and and we've talked about it. Like, I know when we meet, it's going to be weird for like the first five minutes, but it's going to feel like we know each other. And just having that chemistry and, and, and seeing different people on this journey, um, I've really made some close friends and I've lost, you know, I've let, I shouldn't say lost. I wished some of my old friends well in their journey because honestly, Pete, when I think about how people ask me, like, how do you, how do you move on? You know, how do you move on from something? Somebody was just, I look at it as like a book. Life is like a book and life has chapters. And so often a chapter is done. A chapter is in a book for a specific purpose to kind of tell a part of the story, a part of the story that's going to shape. And then that chapter usually bridges to something else. It's a journey to a destination. So I tell people, if you look at your life as a chapter, when that chapter closes, that's not bad. It's not, oh, I want that chapter to go on forever. It's like, no, we're here to have multiple experiences and multiple different situations and careers and partners and everything else. We're not supposed to have the same shit for the rest of our life. That's boring because we're souls having human existences to feel and touch and to smell and, and to do all these things. Um, so it's pretty amazing when, when people don't grasp that and don't see that in themselves. And a God's honest truth, Pete, I, I learned this from uh, spending two years with my mom in and out of convalescent hospitals, rehabilitation hospitals, senior facilities, things of that nature. My grandmother was in those for most of her life when I was a kid. And so I'm very familiar with walking down the hall and looking. I remember this one time when my grandmother was in one of those places. I walked down the hall and I was probably seven or eight years old. And I was just looking out the window or looking out the, the, the doorway, like literally like it's her bedroom. And she's just, and people are walking up down the hall. I'm like, I remember being a little kid, Pete going, that lady used to be successful. That lady would probably used to do stuff. Now she's like in this place by herself. Like what, what, what did you do to get here? And, and how do you feel? And when I got older and my mom went through those situations, I'm a very curious person and I'm very respectful, but I'm not afraid to ask somebody a question, especially if it's going to help me learn and help other people learn. So I started asking these elderly people questions. I'm like, you know, so can I ask you a question? So I'm like, yeah, I understand about life. I want to make sure that I don't make, you know, I hate to say this this way. I, hate, I don't want to make any mistakes, you know? So what advice would you give to your younger self if you were 50 years old and you were comfortably miserable? Oh my God. You know what, Chris? I spent my entire life pretending to be something I wasn't. I was in a loveless relationship, a marriage for 40 years because I thought I had to do that because my religion told me I had to stay married. So I spent my entire life in a relationship with a person I did not love or I loved when I was not in love or I did not like, but I loved and things of that nature. And you could see face, you could hear it in their voice. Like I did that. I chose to do that. And God, what a waste. And so I started talking to more people about regrets. I was like, wow. Okay. And then I got that book, the top five regrets of the dying, which is phenomenal written by a hospice nurse. You know, I could, I haven't even been able to get through the entire thing because there's one story she tells about, you know, seeing some of these people pass and hearing their stories that really just got to me. And I was like, Oh my God, no, 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 no. Now I've, I've read enough. I know that that's why if you look at my social media, it's always hashtag no regrets um, because life is special. And, it, and sometimes we have to, we have to stop and close that story in that chapter to move on to the next one and write it the way we want to see our ending happen. Do you, do you, you know, you talk about this work at the moment, you know, and we talked about collapsing the gap there. I mean, uh, were you ever yourself as a child? Did you ever get that opportunity? 
Yes, there was. There was actually points. My mom, all things considered, it's interesting because I am writing that book right now and I am in that 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 phase. I'm, I'm, I'm titling each chapter, chapter where we lived at that time. So right now I'm in Anaheim. I mean, I'm in 13. That's when we lived at that place. And my mom really tried to make me normal. My mom was not a normal person. She did not have a normal childhood. So she did try uh, in between all the other chaos and, and pandemonium and other BS that was going on in the life that I should not have been subjected to necessarily. Um, but there were times, yeah, definitely. Like um, it was spots, it was spots. Like, you know, I went out and being able to play as a little boy and, and come back when the, when, the lights, uh, when the lights came on, the street lights came on. Music was huge for me. I mean, she would let me blast my music. She's important to me. So we go to the record store and buy records. Um, I would get to play, you know, with my matchbox cars and hot wheels. And when my mom wanted to be, my mom was, was four years old and mentally in her body. And she used to tell me that she goes, I'm four years old. I'm like, mom, you're a grown ass adult. Shut up. And I didn't understand that until much later in life. I'm like four years old, four years old, started doing a bunch of research on child development, child psychology. Where is it that screws us up? That's what, that was my biggest question for years and years and years. It's like, I want to figure that out. I know that all of us in personal development basically say the same thing, but I want to figure it out for me where I never even considered it being when we were kids. I'm like, we're kids, you know, we're just kids. And I go back to that. My mom's saying her, she's four years old. I'm like, four years old. What happened when she was four? Oh, her parents got divorced. Oh, then she was living with her abusive mom who did things to her that made some of the stuff she did to me look like a walk in the park. Oh, and then she was constantly vying for her dad's attention. Oh, that's where the, the, the promiscuous came from. Oh, and I started putting all the pieces of the puzzle. I'm like, yeah, you are four years old. You know, really, you got stunted in that particular situation. Um, so, so it's it's just realizing where it is that we are in our journey and being able to stop and have sympathy and respect for everything that we've been through to realize that it happened for us and to to change our trajectory now in what we focus on and what we do. I hope that answers mm. your question. You no, know, makes makes a lot of sense. What's what's your earliest memory then? My earliest memory. The earliest conscious memory anyway. The one I hang on to that my mom doesn't remember, but I, when, when she was alive, um, I remember being a baby in a baby buggy, like an old fashioned baby buggy. I was born in 69. And I remember looking up from the baby buggy, I could, I could see the overhang and I could see what I think is my mother pushing me. And then all of a sudden it starts to rain. And I remember being afraid because all of a sudden she started running with the buggy and, um, and I was, I was afraid. I was afraid like the buggy was going to tip over or something like that. And when I talked to her later in life, I'm like, yeah, I keep having that. She goes, I don't remember anything like that. Um, but, you know, real memories, I would have to say, um, it's interesting. It's spotty. I have pictures of me when I was a kid and I don't remember stuff. Like, I don't remember where I slept at for the first six years of my life in my first house. I, I'm like, I don't know if I had a bedroom. I think I slept in the living room. I'm not sure. Um, but a lot of my memories are with my mom riding bus everywhere. We barely had a car. So I was constantly going everywhere with her because she was a single mom. And uh, I just remember being on the move a lot. So what was Christopher's plan then? What was he going to do when he grew up? <laughs> Back then, uh, I wasn't sure I wanted to grow up. I wasn't sure I wanted to be alive in the world. My, my existence uh, for many, many years up until the point I was about 18 years old was rather challenging. I didn't, I always struggled to find out where I fit in. I always struggled to find out um, where happiness was going to be and, and what was going to be the meaning of life. It was just like, everything was always a fight. Everything was always a struggle. Everything was always, you have to work hard for it. And I'm like, okay, why does that have to be? Um, but when I was a kid, I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be a race car driver. Um, um, what else did I want to be? It was a rock star and a race car driver. It was like, those are my biggest things. I love music and I love cars. Um, I, have a, I, I think I still have a book somewhere that says Christopher for president. My mom gave it to me when I was in the hospital, getting my tonsils taken out. So I'd consider that for a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, just been, it's just been an amazing experience of everything that I've been through to get me where I'm at today. And, and now I have my childhood friend I'm going to talk to in a couple of weeks to help me write the book because I want to ask him some memories of that time that we lived on that street. So it'll be interesting to talk to him as well and see what he remembers. But uh, yeah, I think that's what I remembered is, is wanting to be a race car driver and a, and a, and a, and a singer or a, a rock rock band guy so now i just drive fast <laughs> love it was was giving up ever an option for you i mean you talk about being lost there you talk about obviously there's a lot of 
a lot of history and a lot of you know a lot going on there in those times. I mean, was it always a case of just fight harder and go further, or just no. enough was enough? No, I gave up many times. I gave up um, at a very early age. I mean, I started smoking marijuana when I was 12 years old. I started smoking cigarettes when I was 13. I started drinking when I was probably 15. Um, uh, started doing harder drugs when I was 17, 18, um, tried to commit suicide twice. Fortunately, I sucked at it and it was not obviously successful. I didn't really want to die, but I was just, a, again, at a point in my life where I was so tired of trying and fighting to fit in and trying fighting to get, uh, everybody's love and, and respect. And I was just so sick of not being wanted and not being, um, being happy. And so in that point, in that realization, I had to start making some tough decisions to change that trajectory around. And I'm so glad that I did to be able to make that happen. Well, what triggered the change? I mean, surely is that not a slippy slope? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a slippy slope. I mean, I was, uh, I was, I was really good at drinking. I was really good at partying and ignoring my life and trying to pretend that it was all okay. Uh, back in the story, um, you know, through, through writing this book and really realizing, uh, my path in life, I realized that abandonment was always an issue for me that I never realized, you know, biological father never was there. Biological sister, half sister left when I was nine years old to go live with her dad. Um, mom's new husband was only there for a little while, was abusive, left, wouldn't be a dad to me, would be a dad to his son. Um, all these different things of abandonment, abandonment had gone through my life. And then up until, um, May 10th, 1982, I was living in a middle-class home in a middle-class suburb of Southern California. Everything was supposedly okay. And then my mom's cat got sick. My mom's favorite cat got sick. My mom had 18 cats. Well, actually she had over 30 cats and four dogs. Um, at one point, my mom was a cat lady, all super clean. That was my responsibility. I had to clean all the cat boxes and take care of all the cats. Um, her cats were her number one priority in her life. And this number one cat got sick. After her husband left, after her daughter left, it was just me and her. Then she lost her job. And then this cat got sick and she spent the last of our money trying to save this cat who died of feline AIDS leukemia. Um, then it was interesting because all of a sudden I got pulled out of seventh grade. I'd barely been in the seventh grade for very long. I got pulled out of seventh grade to go collect cans and bottles and start house cleaning and doing whatever I could do to bring, bring money in. And again, I was about 12 or 13 years old not realizing that my mother had spent the rent money on trying to save her cat and she tried to save the cat and she pawned a bunch of stuff to try to save the cat. So we were broke and the mortgage or the rent was due on the house. And so we went from living in a four bedroom house to living in a 1969 country squire station wagon um, with 18 cats and four of the dogs because we couldn't catch, catch all the cats. Uh, it was craziness. And then from essentially the age of 13 to 17, a little over 17, I was on the streets, homeless, living in the car, living in trashy motels, living in a uh, uh, abandoned van in somebody's driveway, living in somebody's garage. Um, I'd been everywhere and done everything um, in those four years. And so realizing that and seeing all the people, seeing the drug addicts and the, and the alcoholics and the people in prison and all these different aspects of people in this last place that we were at, I, uh, I came walking back. It was after I'd already tried to commit suicide twice and sucked at it. And I walked back into the motel and uh, this black guy stopped me and he goes, he goes, hey man, he goes, you want to buy a, a carton of Marlboros for uh, five bucks? And I'm like, oh, yo, dude, I don't smoke Marlboros. I said, I smoke menthols. And he's like, what? And I was like, no, seriously, dude. I said, I, I don't smoke Marlboro Reds. He goes, all you white people smoke Marlboro Reds. Don't tell me you smoke menthols. And I'm like, I smoke menthols, dude. If it was a carton of Cools or Newports or something like that, I would buy it for me for five bucks. Shit, I've had to go steal cigarettes, right? And all of a sudden he snaps and he thinks I'm like somebody that's out to get him pulls out a gun and puts it towards my head says, Oh, is it because I'm black? I'm like, dude, I don't care what fucking color you are. I said, I grew up in Inglewood. All my friends are black. My first best friend was Tyrone. He died of sickle cell anemia. I don't care what color your skin is. I care what color the pack of the cigarettes are and I don't smoke. Well, that's what it was. No, he didn't put the gun to my head yet. So then I reached back into my pocket and that's when the gun, that's right. That's when the gun. And I said, and I had the cigarettes like here and I was like, Oh shit. And because he was making fun of me because black people, at least where I was at, they all smoke menthols. And that was kind of a, a stigma or whatever it is you want to be. I don't know what the fuck you call it. But I was like, dude, I, this is right. And as soon as I do this, my buddy Will comes out, another black guy. And he knows me. He knows me and my mom. He's like, dude, him and his moms are cool. Him and his moms are cool. The gun's still right there. And I just snapped. And I'm like, if you're going to pull the trigger, pull it, pull it, do it. 
I'm tired of this. I am tired of it. I mean, I literally snapped. I was like, ready to go. I'm like, it'll be one shot. It'll be over. My mom's going to have to deal with this. Eh, F you. And then gun, gun came away and I was like, all right. And we talked. And so um, I was pretty scared at that point, Pete. I was like, you know what? Life is pretty much sucked up until this point. Um, get up. I can't remember. It was a couple of days, a couple of weeks later, whatever it was, me and my buddy that lived there. Also, we worked together uh, doing telemarketing. I had three different jobs. So one of my jobs was telemarketing and it was kind of sounds kind of creepy. I did it out of this guy's uh, bedroom in his apartment. So me and my friend, Robert would go to Huntington beach every day, which is about a 20 minute drive, Huntington beach, California, most people surf city, beautiful place. We get there and we had a pretty decent job uh, because my mom didn't work. I had to work all these jobs to pay for the rent for the motel and buy food uh, to try to keep us from being evicted. And so we went to work one day and uh, I remember this guy, his name is Norman. We were selling, um, we were setting appointments for roofing contractors to go out and give estimates. One off, one bedroom set up as an office. And we're like, hey, what's up? And he was a super nice guy. He was like one of the nicest guys I met. And he's like, hey guys, I got some good news and bad news. And I'm like, I've had enough bad news to last a lifetime. What's the good news? And he goes, well, the good news is, I goes, I know you guys live in that motel. And I go, you guys are you're trying to save up for your first and last. You guys are trying to do all these things. He goes, uh, I want to leave you my apartment. And we're like, okay, leave you. Okay, what's the bad news? Uh, I'm moving to Texas. Okay. Are we still going to do our job? Blah, blah, blah. And no. Okay. So he goes, everything goes, but I want to go to the man a lot more flexible because I just want to sign over my lease to you so you guys can have a place to stay, you know, a nice place to stay. And me and Robert looked at each other and was like, us live here? Gated community, you know, a, a, a fitness centers and pools and, and soda pop machines. And we lived literally in the underbelly of Anaheim. It was like, literally, like, that's the last place you stay if you don't even want to go to jail. I'm like, Oh my God, dude. And we just start talking like, we can get Rambo. We can get your brother. We can do this. You know, da, da, da. how much is the rent? Okay. It's eight fifty. I still remember this. I'm like, okay, dude, if we do this, we a couple hundred bucks. I'd like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And thinking about it. And I was like, you know what? After everything I'd been through with my mom, my mom had been raped when I was 15 years old. I went through that. She went to court. She fought against the guy while we were homeless. Um, all these different things. I'm like, she, she if I tell her this, she's going to be happy for me. You know, she's going to, she's got, this is going to be, she's going to tell me to go. She's going to tell me to do this. You know, this is, this is my chance. And I went back to the motel and I'm like, mom, guess what? Da, 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 da. I'm like naive, naive. I'm like, mom's going to finally show me love and say, you know, Chris, go be on your own. I've screwed up your life enough. I keep doing this to myself. You don't deserve to have to take care of me. Like you've had to take care of me since you were a little boy. Nope. Told me to go F myself. Told, call me a piece of shit. Call every word. How could you be so selfish? And blah, blah, blah. I mean, just literally just vomited everything negative into me to make me feel bad. And I was just like, really just stunned. Honestly, I was just stunned. And I was like, wow, what did I ever do to this person? I think that's what I said. This person, I didn't say my mom. I'm like, what did, what did I ever do? To I can't remember what happened after that, but long and short it was, I sat on the top of the stairs to answer your question. I sat on the top of the stairs and I looked at the, the cops, the drug dealers, the prostitution, the drunks fighting, you know, like they did every night, the two couple, I can't remember their name now. Um, sweet couple. They were, a, when they were sober, they were the nicest people, but every night they got drunk and yelled and screamed at each other. It was sad. It was really sad. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get out of this motel in one of three ways. I'm going to die here. I'm going to go to jail or I'm going to choose to get out of here. And now I've just been given a key. I've just been given an open door. Chris, you can leave the situation and go live your life. You can go do this. Immediately, selfish, self-serving. What's mom gonna do? She's weak. I can't leave her in this place. She doesn't have any money. Da, da, da. It's my responsibility. Everybody else has left her. You know, I'm her only son. Blah, 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 blah. Dead, prison, choice. Pick. And I picked the choice. I'm like, mom, I got to go. I said, I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave. I'm going to leave the motel, but I'm not going to leave you. And God's honest truth. I got to talk to my ex-wife about this. We're still super friends. She remembers that I used to go back to that motel nearly every night and help her take care of her cats. Uh, Cause she had cats hidden in the room that nobody knew about. Um, I would take her money. I would take her food and progressively she got stronger and I got stronger and here's where I'm at today. So honestly, Pete, um, I got to a point where I just, the pain was so much, the pain was so much that we do things for one of two reasons to avoid pain and to gain pleasure. 
I couldn't gain pleasure any way else. So I had to deal with the pain. I had to deal with it. And God is my witness as tough that decision was. I'm still surprised that I made it sometimes. Um, greatest decision of my life. I would probably be dead or in jail right now. Well, thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Did you ever blame yourself? Oh. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Blame myself. Hell yeah. Look at my sister, my, my biological father never came around. Oh, is that me? Oh, you didn't want to have a kid. Uh, sister left when I was, um, uh, nine years old. I was like, why did she leave? Was I not a good enough brother? Did I not, you know, try to make things with my mom better? Um, everybody. Yeah. I, I mean, of course I blame myself when I got bullied at home because I remember I had to come back and tell my mom one time that I got my ass kicked and she made it out to be my fault. And I'm like, Okay, what did I do to that kid that caused? Okay, I guess maybe I'm causing this. Oh yeah, spent years and years and years and years thinking it was myself. And then um, got around some smart people, started looking at what successful people do and read a ton of self-help books. I remember somebody gave me Tony Robbins cassette tapes, which are still down in my garage. I'm finally gonna get rid of them. I have a bunch of stuff that I'm gonna donate. Um, I've hung on to them because they've symbolized something and I tend to be a pack rat in some respects of things that, have shifted my life. I'm like, Chris, you don't need the cassettes anymore. Get rid of them, go donate them. But um, yeah, and it was through uh, seeking out therapy and everything else and just realizing I was a poor, innocent little kid in a situation that was specifically there for me to get stronger and to become the person I am today and to help people get through that very situation that I went through or somebody else went through. And one of the greatest accomplishments from all of that, Pete, was like I said, seventh grade, I got pulled out. So I'm a seventh grade homeless dropout living in the backseat of a station wagon with 18 cats, four dogs, psychotic mother, all these different things, all this different shit that happened to me. And ultimately wound up going back and getting my GED, which here in the United States, general equivalency diploma. Um, I got around some smart people and they said, Hey, Chris, you should go back to school. And through that process of doing that, I just realized that the only person to blame in, in your life is, is, is yourself. If you don't choose to get better. If you don't choose to identify the fact that there's something wrong, that is your fault. You should blame yourself for putting up with stuff and tolerating stuff that you otherwise would probably tell your best friend or your mother, you shouldn't tolerate that. You shouldn't do that. Cause we're so, we're so quick to tell our friends, oh, you shouldn't be in a relationship that doesn't make you happy. Like, oh, are you, are you happy? Like, uh, no. So you should blame yourself if you're not happy. You shouldn't blame yourself for things that other people did because they didn't know any better either. So for me, um, taking all of that, and realizing that I wanted to take that message and go share it with other kids. And I remember laying in the back seat of that station wagon. I remember going to sleep when it was early on and just thinking to myself, all I want is a home where nobody can bother me. All I want is a home that nobody can take away from me. All I want is my own place, my own sanctuary. Um, and I think at that point, I really wanted it for myself because I didn't like anybody else. Nobody else in my life, aside from my friends when I was a little kid, really gave me much comfort. My grandfather did, um, but in taking all that, um, I said, you know, one thing I'd really like to do is go back to the school I dropped out of and go back and speak to the seventh and eighth grade class and tell them, Hey, here's what's up. Here's what's up. You're going to go through a bunch of stuff in your life, but guess what? I'm living proof. You can make it mean something and, uh, and turn it all around. And he's like, Oh, what school was it? And offhandedly, I said, Brookhurst junior high. And he goes, Oh, what? I said, Brookhurst junior high over there in Anaheim off Brookhurst. He's like, no, I'm not saying like, what? I'm like, that's where my wife works. She's a PE coach. I'm like, what? Well, what a, what a quinky. And I didn't even think anything of that. He goes, well, let me go, let me go home and talk to her. I'm like, PE coach. Yeah. Okay. You're going to arrange this whole, sim, the, this whole assembly for me to walk in there and tell everybody, Hey, I dropped out here and look, I'm successful. Now a couple of days later, he goes, Hey, um, the, here's the number to the principal. He wants to talk to you about setting it up. I'm like, Whoa, talk about full circle, Pete, full circle. I had not stepped foot in that. I've driven, I'd driven by that school a, a few times to kind of realizing, Oh yeah but I never stepped foot in that parking lot again. And going on that, the grounds that day, I had a, a guy from my work, he was a, was a videographer. He's like, dude, I wanna video this. And I'm like, all right. So we set up the lights and everything. It's actually a, a video on my YouTube channel. Um, and going into that, that, that gym that day, I still get chills because I walked in, I'm like, wow, wow. And all the kids started filing in. And I remember Pete, I was like, am I, are they bringing me seventh and eighth graders? Or are they bringing me like fifth graders? I, I didn't know if they bust somebody in because I was looking at these kids. I'm like, these kids are small. These kids are little. And I pictured myself 
especially at that point, Pete, I thought I was an adult. I thought I was so much bigger. When I saw these kids, I was like, there is no way I was that little when I was homeless. I was like, whoa. So I spoke to the seventh and eighth grade class, had kids come up to me, tell me, oh man, thank you for sharing that. I'm currently in Olive Crest Children's Home, which is a place that I mentor to. I'm like I'm in Olive Crest or, hey, I'm living with my grandmother because my mom's an alcoholic or blah, blah, I'm living here, I'm staying. And these kids would just come up to me and giving me hugs and high fives. I was like, whoa. I just took all the shit in my life and turned around and honestly and, and congruently and as transparently as I possibly could, told those kids, whatever you're going to go through in your life, if you choose to keep going, you choose to have that stamina, you choose not to be a victim, that you will make it. And if you have the determination that whatever you go through, that you're going to use that to help other people on the other end, then that's even a bonus. And from that point forward, I never look back on wanting to inspire people, help people, um, be a conduit, be honest, just to, just to be vulnerable. Because I never told people I was homeless. I never told people all the stories about the guy at Burger King who would get, give us the food that people would like send back that was like had mustard on it or something like that. We would cut that part off. They took a bite out of it and we would eat it. And that guy from Burger King like would bring it every day. He's like, hey man, I'm, I, I feel kind of weird doing this, but this is still good food. And I'm like, thank you. And we'd have cold French fries or whatever else, but I would never tell anybody that story because I was so embarrassed. And, you know, thinking about your original part about blame, I never, I never, I don't blame anybody in situation that it is what it was. It is what it was. And all of us have that determination to say, okay, it is what it is. What is my choice to, ter to determine how am I going to view this? Am I going to view this as, a, oh, poor me. Oh, look what happened to me again. And then am I going to have that perspective for the rest of my life looking for situations that are for poor me? I teach, Pete, I teach people like you can be a victim or a victor. You can have a one day pity party, jump up and down, stomp your feet, blame the world, flip everybody off. And then tomorrow morning you get up and say, okay, listen, what am I thankful for? What are my intentions today? And what's one thing I can do today that's gonna move me forward in the, the goal of who it is that I wanna be remembered for, for my time here. And I teach people to do that. And it's amazing, dude. It's, it's, it's such a reward. I can't even tell you. Well, do you know how the cats and the dogs, I mean, what value or what connection did your mother have to those? Mm, that's a great question. I don't think I've ever been asked that. Um, my mother, my mother was, like I said, four years old. And one of the, her first big, I'm trying to think things, I guess she loved stuffed animals like crazy. She was this grown woman. She's like, Oh my God, she get, I'm like, who does that? You, you look like you're a little girl. So she always had these stuffed animals. She took really good care of them. And then the, the animals came along with them. But then I started realizing, and I do this too myself. I found this too, because I have cats and I have dogs and, and I just love them. It's, it's that unconditional love. She was abused mentally, physically, not sexually that I know of, mentally and physically. Uh, her parents divorced. She spent her entire life trying to get into the graces of her, of her father, trying to prove herself. She even went to the same profession that he did. I was just writing about this yesterday. You know, how when we see my grandfather, it was like only for special occasions. Um, she constantly tried to win back his love and his respect. And the only thing that she could do were the animals, because no matter what she did, they always loved her. They always were there for her. They're always excited to see her. And I feel the same way. It's like, I wish people could be more like animals. I told my wife this, I said, I come through the door and the dog goes absolutely bananas. Like I've been gone for five minutes. I said, I could be gone all day, 16 hour day. Hey babe. Hey, from the couch. I'm like, run up and, and be excited to see somebody, you know? So for her, I think that was the situation where it was just like unconditional love. She wanted to save uh, innocence. I think she was trying to save innocence. Um, but it actually ultimately cost her so much in her life, you know, with other people, with relationships and everything else. Um, but yeah, I think that's what it was. I think it was just the psychological love couldn't be taken away from her. She could control it. She could get when she wanted. Um, and it just comforted her. What did, what did your mother do? What was her background? Um, she was, she was an interesting person. Her profession was she was in purchasing. She was a purchasing agent or a purchasing manager um, for major manufacturing. Um, so she did that for quite a number of years. And then she got out of that when uh, we got, when we lost the house and she kept trying to find another job, but she didn't keep her skills updated. So then she wound up getting into typesetting and type typography and, and um, graphic arts and stuff like that. She wanted to do that for a bit too. Hmm. And in school, is there any particular subject that you took a connection or a fascination to in, in school? Hmm. Um, yeah, definitely not math, not science. 
not history. More, I was more, I was more, I mean, it depends on what school. If we're talking about grade school. Um, I always love to be creative. Uh, I've never been an artist per se, but um, as I got older, uh, the, the classes that I really liked were like uh, personal communication, personal development, or uh, interpersonal communication or anything that related to people and, and leading and, um, you know, being, being a better person, being a better uh, leader. That was one of the, my biggest things that I really, really dug to. And um, yeah, it just, it's just about having that curiosity of, of what can make us better. But uh, school is never my thing. It was, it was, it was something I got through. Uh, about you know how do I understand the, the mind how do I understand people better uh, to make the world a better place for who I am and what I do what about you what was your favorite what was your favorite subject in school what was my favorite subject um so it was probably it probably was the arts and the creative things you know it was that uh I was sort of undiagnosed with the dyslexia thing so I was like yeah sort of square peg round hole yeah keep keep hammering in you'll get through eventually you know and it's like and then, of course, you do, you, you go the other way and saying, well, OK, so I can't pass the test, but what I can do is make a scene or I can, you know, I can bully or I can do something else. You know, it's a distraction techniques, which is what we recognize them as now, you know, and sort of if you can't do X, Y and Z, then you, you kick off in some other way, which is sort of, yeah, look over here so you don't see what's happening here, you know, and um, yep. isn't it funny the way we do things and totally subconsciously, right? You mm -hmm. know, you just to. To get attention or to distract attention to to you know to displace it somehow mm -hmm. no that's true i mean that's that's uh that's one of the things that people talk about being angry you know when i'm angry it's the perception of being in control or commanding the attention or you know trying to drive the outcome this if i get attention and i can do this and defer it away from me um yeah it's, it's pretty interesting how we do that and how we think it's actually in our benefit when we do that but later on in life we look back and go Mm, yeah that probably didn't serve me very well did it <laughs> it is as you say you, you look back now and there's so many things you kind of go yeah that was sort of classic of you know like i recognize those traits now it's like yeah i was i was calling nobody but i was calling myself yeah. you know it's uh so tell us i mean take us on through then i mean you, you talked about sort of getting the end of that period that sort of 17 18 year old period what what what, what kicked on from there Um, yeah, that's where, that's where a lot of fun and excitement really happened. That's where a lot of growth came. Um, like I said, we moved into the apartment and, uh, quickly my life changed. I mean, I was, I was partying and, and trying to have a good time, but you know, I'd never really dated up until that point. Um, I'd always been, you know, number one was what's mom want. What does mom need? What, is, what is mom doing? Making sure I'm not pissing mom off, making sure I'm, you know, everything was about that. And then moving out and doing that, even though I went back there nearly every night it was just about meeting people and just being me and just like oh my god this is amazing and i have my own room again and just all this stuff and uh started just started meeting people started having parties and my buddy worked at kmart who lived with us and he came back and goes hey by the way guys we're gonna have a party tonight we got some people coming over we're like oh okay you know we're just like five you know bachelors in this apartment so we started cleaning everything up and these girls started coming over and they brought stuff and it was like wow this is really cool and uh at, at that point it might have been only three of us living there because there was three girls and there was three of us and there was two other guys that kind of crashed in our cow. I met this girl and her name is Tammy and Tammy and I got along really sweet, became boyfriend and girlfriend, and then ultimately got married. And through that relationship, I met her parents, uh, Beverly and Bill. And I had never really had, aside from my grandfather, I never really had a male father figure who gave a shit about me. You know, some of my mom's dates, you know, if they're around for a while, like one of them taught me how to ride a bike. Um, he was really cool. Zeke, I think his name was, um, you know, but so in meeting, in meeting Tammy's dad, you know, here I am this long haired cigarette smoking seventh grade dropout, been homeless, living in a bachelor pad and come to find out she's like, not like the prom queen, but she's like, you know, more wealthy, you know, higher middle, higher middle class, you know, nice area, Fountain Valley. And so meeting her parents, I was just like, oh my God, they're going to take one look at me and tell me, get away from my daughter. Because I remember the old movie with uh, Nick Cage, Valley Girl. Like he's from the one side of the track. She's from the other side of the track. And that stuff never works. It kind of works. And I thought they're going to take one look at me and I get the hell out of here. Stay away from my daughter. And they welcomed me with open arms. And it was really surprising because it was one of the first times that I'd been embraced and accepted for who I was. And I didn't have to explain anything. I didn't have to defend anything. I was like, Oh, you know, 
it was like, they were like, okay, Chris, whatever, whatever you've been through is cool. We just want to get to know you. And through those conversations, guy, and he's like, hey, Chris, why don't you go back to school? And I'm like, Bill, come on, what are you, I'm going to go back to high school? Really? I'm like way older than any, I could not ever hang around any high school kids. I was always, every part of my life, I was always around people who were at least 10, 20 years older than me. And so I laughed. He's like, no, 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 you can get the GED. And I thought, GED, I'm stupid. You know, literally my mom called me stupid so many times throughout my life that I thought I was, I didn't think I was smart. And I'm like, you know, I want, I don't want to go back to school and, and, and fail or, and, and, and make anybody, you know, I was like scared. And he's like, no, 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 you can go and do this. And I thought about it and I was like, his daughter's really nice. You know, I'm going to give this thing a shot. Why not? Why not? You know, he's successful. He's the president of a trucking company. He lives in a nice house. Maybe he knows what's going on. And I remember that Pete, I remember like being defensive, like, oh, you're going to tell me to go back to school because school works for you. Da, da, da. And I was like, mm -mm 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 -mm. I'm like, Chris, Chris, he's got food in his refrigerator. He's got a car that he doesn't have to worry about starting every day. You might want to listen to him. Went down, got into, went down to the school, took a test, thought they were going to tell me I had to start back in the fifth grade or something like that. And they said, no, actually you're, you're not too bad. You need, I think it was three classes. I think I needed science, math, and something else to get my GED. It's like your English was great. This was great. History was great, whatever it was. So I think I went to school for, I want to say it was about six weeks. I think it was six weeks. Um, that was funny. And then I wound up going back and then I took the test and I was like, I'm not going to pass. I'm not going to pass. I didn't think very confident about anything that I was doing. I'm not going to pass. At least I said, I tried. I came back, boom, you passed. You have your GED. Wow. Told my mom, mom, I got a diploma. I got a diploma. Yeah, whatever. No, I'm actually, I have a high school diploma now. It's not high school, high school, but it's, it's, a, it's an equivalent. Okay. And then, so I went back and showed Bill, like, hey, look what I did. He's like, that's great, Chris. Oh my God. How do you feel? I'm like, I feel great. You know, I didn't think I could do it. He goes, yeah. So uh, what do you think about going to college? Huh? Me? <laughs> yeah, right. Because in that, at that point I had college, like that's, that's what you see the people in the movies do. Those are the smart people. Those are the people that have money. Those are the people that are going to go places in their life. Right. My college, what? He's like, yeah, you know, just go to Golden West Community College, you know, just take one class, just go to start taking one class, see if it's for you. I was like, all right, well, still like your daughter, still like you, good advice, eh, go to school, I'm, I'm, I'm working two jobs, blah, blah, all right, go down to Golden West Community College, and I tell people this all the time, like, I had no idea, zero idea, I walked through the front door, I went to the first desk I went to, and I said, hi, I'd like to come to school here. It's like, okay, great, you go over there to the admissions uh, desk. And I went there and like, they asked me a bunch of questions. Like what high school did you go to? I'm like, well, I didn't really go to high school. I went to this blah, 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 and I became this pain already. And I was like, oh. and I think that lady took mercy on me. Cause I was like, you know what? I want to do this, but I, I just don't feel like I, I fit here. She's like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. And I must've been there for a couple of hours, Pete. And just thinking like, okay, I'm waiting for somebody to come out and say, okay, sir, you need to leave or something like that. Cause I was told to get out of play. This is, and um, they pulled out the, the thing and like, well, you know, if you want to start in this semester, da, 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 you have like these four classes. And one of them was interpersonal communication class. And I was like, that one's easy. I can do that one. <laughs> you know, I was there like, okay, maybe if I just take one class, he'll be happy and he'll leave me alone. So sign up for the interpersonal communications class. I'm like, I know how to talk. And, uh, and went back and told him like, Hey, I've got it. I've got a parking thing. And da, da, da. And I, it was back when tuition was pretty cheap. And I did it. And then I went back and I told my friends. And here's the funny part, Pete, is I went back and told my friends, I'm like, hey guys, you know, when I told them I went back for my GED, GED, they thought I was stupid. Oh, he's trying to impress his girlfriend. And, and at that point I was like, before I would have said, oh yeah, no, I want to make you happy. I don't want to, I don't want to get smart. I want to, I don't want you guys to think like I'm a, like I'm a poser or like I'm, I'm like losing any of your love or significance. But I remember like, okay, these guys, are here. The smart guys over here, the smart guys telling me this and now they're telling me that's stupid. That doesn't seem right. Right. You know, I tell people life is simple. That doesn't seem right. And when I started, when I went to college and all my buddies were around me, I mean, I'm trying to space this out a little bit, but they were just like, Oh, Mr. Smarty pants, Mr. College boy. Da, da, da. And again, no, no, I, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to do this. And, and maybe you guys should go to school too. Oh, now you're going to try, you're going to get all big and get on your soapbox to tell us what to do. And I remember I'm like, and that's when I really first learned about chapters, Pete. Because it was like, my girlfriend and I started doing better. And she was like, you know what? You don't need to live in this place with these guys. And da, 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 da. 
And so we wound up, you know, they wound up continuing doing drugs. I tried a bunch of different things. Fortunately, by the second or third time, I went, it's three o'clock in the morning and I want more of this. That's not a good idea. That's not a good feeling. I remember logically saying this was fun, but three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I shouldn't be wanting more stuff. And that was the last time I ever did it. I was cocaine. And uh, I was like, you know what? No, I don't. I want to have fun, but I don't want to have anything have power over my life. I've spent enough of my life with people being at the mercy of something. No, I want to just be me. I just want to go out. This guy believes in me, then let's do this. And, you know, had to, had to wish a lot of friends well. Uh, one of my friends really became addicted to cocaine, had a bunch of stuff happen to him. Wound up getting born again, wound up coming back at me later on in life, tell me like a couple of years later, telling me that all the heavy metal we were listening to, I was going to go to hell for. And I was like, all right, dude, I'm glad you're off the drugs. Good luck. And uh, just kept marching, kept marching. And we wound up getting married. We were married for a while. I was going to school. I wound up getting uh, my associate's degree. It took me, I don't know, five years to get my associate's degree, something like that. And then uh, wound up getting divorced. We got married way too young. Got married when we were 19. Got divorced, um, 23, 24. And I was like, you know what? And that, that, was, that was tough for, for Bill and I, for her dad to go through that because we had really become close. Um, and I knew he was hurt when it, we, just, we just couldn't work it out. It was just like, you know, we're just, we've changed. We're, we shouldn't have gotten married when we were 19. Um, we're still to this day, still dear friends. She loves my current wife, my current wife and her hang out. I had both of them on my, my radio show. I told you about earlier, you know, and I teach people that like, how do you do that? How are you friends with all your exes? I'm like, because I'm not a dick, you know, things end, but they don't have to end badly. You, you end them before they end badly. That's the smart thing to do. Don't end when you have to, you had an affair. Don't end when you, you know, you're doing end it before that shit happens and say, Hey, listen, I still care about you. And I think that you deserve to be happy with somebody who's more into it than I am. And I do too. Is that okay? Is that good? Oh, you suck. And then later on, they come back. Oh, that was really nice. So you man, I found friends this day and I wound up uh, going back to school and get my bachelor's degree. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna get my bachelor's degree. Interesting thing, Pete, uh, just to put it in their perspective. When I told my mom, my mom, I was graduating from, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Golden West College with my associate's degree. She says, oh, that's good. Um, I said, mom, you're gonna be there? She says, no, I have to work. I'm like, mom, your son is graduating from college. I was a seventh grade homeless dropout. I mean, everything I've been through, you can't come to my graduation. I have to work. Um, I think you should be there. Cause I was still helping her out. I'm like, I think you should be there. So I had to beg my mom to come to that graduation. I had to beg her to come to my bachelor's graduation. I graduated from University of Phoenix with a bachelor's degree. Mom, graduating, got a bachelor's degree. Anaheim Convention Center, it's a big deal. I have to work. Mom, you need to be there. I was like, what do I have to do to earn her respect, her, her, her um, attention, her validation? Like, Chris, wow, that's, oh my God, you have turned your life around. You've done everything and so many things that I couldn't do. No. And I was like, got my bachelor's degree. I was like, all right. Hmm. I'm going to go on a master's degree in organizational management. And I did it for a couple of reasons because once I started learning, it was addictive. It was like, wow, the more I know, the more opportunities I have to have conversations with different people, the more opportunities I have to earn more money, the more opportunities I have to consider different perspectives, the more opportunity I understand that as long as I apply myself to things that I can actually get them done and that I'm not stupid. And so I got my master's degree. And again, I told mom, your son's graduating with a master's degree. Uh, I have to work. I'm going to say this differently this time, mom. If you don't show up to my graduation, uh, you'll never see me again. And that's the line I had to draw on the sand. I was like, you know what, mom, I'm tired of fighting to try to get your attention and everything else. I worked my ass off. I went to school, dude, seriously, from 17 until I graduated when I was 30. I went to school. Not, I took a, a three-month break between my bachelor's degree and my master's degree. But literally from 17 when I got my GED, I went to school until I was 30, got my master's degree and bought my first house. And, um, and that's when, that's when I really decided to, to take the coaching and the speaking and everything else to the next level. Cause like, I've done all these things, you know, I just dedicated my life to doing these things. I've graduated. I I'm smart. Da, 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 da. So it was just another opportunity for me to, to pay it back, to take all the things that happened in my life and to, to make it mean something positive. And that was the best, that was the best gift to be able to do that to, um, especially to the kids. Your mother, I mean, the, the sort of traits and characteristics comes across as narcissism. Does that, does that sound, does that resonate? Yeah. Narcissism, multiple personality disorder, 
Yeah. Um, OCD. Um, yeah, she had quite a few different, um, actually it was interesting. I was, uh, I found something recently where I was going every once in a while I'd go get therapy and my mom would say, okay, listen, I'm going to write out your grandmother's psychiatric history, my psychiatric history so that, that the therapist can know what you're dealing with, that you dealt with. And I read it the other day and I was just like, it's that she was proud of it. She had all these labels to identify why she was screwed up. It's like, and I have this and I have this and I, I'm like, it's almost like a badge of honor. I'm like, mm -mm, that nah, doesn't work for me. But uh, yeah, there was, there was a lot of different things in there, but she really did try. I mean, she had her moments like for Christmases and birthdays and other occasions, she would go all out. She would try to be a super mom one day of the year to make up for the last quarter where she was, you know, a super bitch or whatever else. Um, but, you know, honestly, she was her own worst enemy in the things that she chose to read and, and chose to believe. And uh, so much growth and opportunity in my life to have her as, as, as my main caretaker for, for my journey that, um, you know, I thank her for that. And I thank her for um, being the person that she was because it allowed me to become the person I needed to grow into. Do you think she was jealous or begrudging that you actually managed to get on? I don't think she was jealous. I think for her, it was all about manipulation and control. And when she realized she could no longer long manipulate and card for her, but still later in life, I mean, she managed to, she was in that motel. This is a true story. She was in that motel until it was nearly condemned. Uh, what happened was it was right next to a freeway and um, um, the city of Anaheim or, Los or uh, Orange County or whatever it was, wanted to widen the freeway. So they had to buy that property. So by default, whoever was in the motel at that very last stage got relocation expenses. So my mom got $7,000, managed to get out of that motel, bought a four bedroom house with a pool. I'm like, mom, we can go get a one bedroom apartment and, and I can go back to school. You know, we could have always done those little things. She could have made sacrifices. She could have got rid of the animals. She could have got two jobs. You know, we could have done something to make it. And, and she never did. And it was all about that control, control and manipulation. So even when she got out of that and she got a full-time job and she, now she had this house and she had a normal life for quite a period of time, but she would still try to man, manipulate and control me. And sometimes it would work. Um, she would make me feel guilty. So I would let her have my car for a while and I would take her car. Her car was a POS. Um, like, no, I still haven't, I still haven't healed. I'm still that little boy inside. So it was just through that, through that course of, realizing, but I don't think she was ever jealous. I think ultimately when I became more successful, she used it again. Like, Oh, you're my best project ever. Like she would start to take, take responsibility for my, Oh, my son has a master's degree because that used to piss me off too. I'm like, uh, yeah, no. Um, but it wasn't until later in life that I really did understand her more. Um, and, um, being able to respect what she had been through in her own journey and what she had done to herself. You know, she was still a really good person. I mean, it, it sucks. I wound up getting my sister. I wound up finding my sister later in life. I wound up trying to get them all back together because I only always wanted my family together. And unfortunately that didn't work. But when I found my sister, what was interesting is I hadn't seen her. This was 2005. I'm bad with dates. Um, so I was in my thirties or something like that and found her and she was nine years older than me. And she turned out exactly like my mom. She turned out exactly like my dad. She was supposed to have a normal life. She did the same exact stuff as my mom. She became a victim. She became, she smoked, I mean, everything down to like having a ton of books and a ton of cats, everything became exactly like my mom. And when we started to reunite, I guess, she's like, baby brother, how did you not turn out like mom? And I'm like, I chose not to be. That was it. I chose not to be. I chose not to be like her. I have some of her tendency, of course, but nope. Nope. And then ultimately a short time later, I had to wish my sister well and say, Hey, you know, you're, 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 you're better. And my mom used to say, she goes, your sister's going to do me one better. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? She goes, she's going to, she's going to, she's going to self-destruct herself earlier than I did. And she was very cognizant of that. She's like, yeah. And so I haven't talked to my sister since 2005. I wished her well. I'm like, you know, and, uh, haven't looked back. I'm curious that, you know, your sister followed the path of your mother, but yet you chose not to. I mean, that fork in the road, and we talked about the, the fork way at the start, you know, of, you know, it's all the different traits that we have and we take left or we take right, or we just stand there. Well, you know, it's like, or we go backwards, you know, it's, it's any of the, the choices. 
you, have you any sense of what caused the nudge or caused it the right way? Any perception? For me? Hmm. It was, it was pain. It was, it was realizing that if, you know, life, life is, um, success leaves clues is what somebody told me. And I can't remember who it was success leaves clues. So if you want to turn out somebody like that, copy them. And if you don't, don't. Okay. And really being around the right people, like, you know, again, Stephen Covey says, you're like the five people you're around the most. So I tell my, I tell my people, take out a sheet of paper, take out a simple piece of paper, take out a simple piece of paper, write the five people you're on the most and just write positive, negative, positive, negative. Don't if, and or positive, negative, positive. If these people are negative, then you need to swap out those people, not kick them to the curb, but you need to make sure you have what we call a board of advisors, a board of directors, you know, somebody that is going to have your best interest at heart. I'm a part of, um, I have three different accountability partners. I can call my coach and my mentor at any point in time. I have my support system here in my house. Um, so really it was just making sure that I've been, I've been around the right people and, and recognizing when I'm not, you know, I went through a biker phase where I was hanging out with people and started kind of getting around different crowds. And I was like, you know what, that's not me anymore. I don't want to do that. Okay. These are bikers and these, okay. So I'm going to go hang out with these people. So realistically it's been, um, just, just realizing and once I started to realize that my life was my choice and I was in control. Nobody else is in control. Uh, I can choose to reframe my past that, you know, it just, I never look back. It's always been about moving forward without, without hiccups or, or periods of, of being depressed or anything else. I'm normal, but you know, I look at things as how do you stay unstoppable? You keep going. How do you get confidence? You do things that are uncomfortable and awkward and you keep growing and you keep learning. What is that for you? I mean, how do you, how do you keep going when you, when you've been frustrated, when you've been down, when you've wanted to give up, how do you do that? I think it's, for me now, it's it's the fire in the belly. It's like, I just, you know, it's like people say, well, how do you know? It's like, my fire in the belly is the fire in the belly project. I know it's bigger than me. And I'm sort of, yeah, fair enough. I'm one of the key facilitators. I'm one of the drivers, but I know that the project is. And it's like, now it's like, I just have to keep going. You know, it's like we, you know, do X number of interviews every day. I'm phoning, speaking, doing. It's like that's how you know you've got your fire in your belly when you're googling at two o'clock in the morning. You're sending emails at God knows what hour. You're inviting yourself on to something that you have no idea how it's going to happen or work. And and but you kind of go, yeah, but that's I'm I've got to be there. It's not about me. It's something bigger picture. It's it's hard and it just takes over and you become obsessed. You know, and it's like listen, the right sort of obsession or the right sort of addiction can be a very good thing. You know, it's down to polarity, right? You know, it's what's the charge? You know, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? <laughs> mm-hmm. so ah, that's true. I love that. Same traits, just different, uh, different energy or different intentions, really. You know, so it's uh, it's trying to it's trying to really sort of mm-hmm. get out Knowing there. What it is that you want? And, <clears throat> and and some people sit there and say, "Well, Chris, I don't know what I want." And I don't know if you've ever run across people like that. What do you want? I don't know what I want. Again, thinking about questions. Then I just ask them, what do you, what do you, what do you not want? Just that, just that perspective shift. Oh, bam. People can unload on you what they don't want. Oh, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. Okay. Well, let's just spin a couple of words and say that. Okay. If you don't want to be lonely, then what you're saying is you want companionship. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. So companionship, I want companionship. Okay. Do you feel like you deserve companionship? Well, okay. Well, let's talk about that. That's why people are so uncomfortable with, with saying what they want, because then they have to do, then they have to actually put through the physical movement to make it happen. So be, I don't know what I want. That's safe. Oh, if you don't know what you want, you poor thing, you'll figure it out one day. It's okay. It's okay. So you tell people what you don't want. Oh, I don't want this. Okay. Then you hold them accountable. Okay. Well, then make sure you don't do it. What are you doing to make sure you don't wind up end up lonely? Uh, 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 what are you doing to make sure you don't, you don't, you don't uh, go broke? What are you doing? To recover? What are you doing to make sure? Well, uh, 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 okay. Well, let's get a plan together. Let's figure it out. You know, keep moving forward, keep pushing, keep trying, you know, every day, get up and, 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 and focus on what it is that you want. So many people focus on what they don't want, Pete, you know, especially here in the United States with the election and everything that's going on, people are focusing on anger and divisiveness and, and truth and facts and all this other stuff. And like, you know what, if you, if that's what you want, you're never going to find it because there's always going to be gray areas of whatever that is. And that's just going to drive you fucking crazy. I want to be happy. I want free. I want that whatever I said that day possibly help somebody, you know, 
I don't need to be right. That's one thing I learned from my coaching and seeing some of the things that my mom did. She always had to be right because she was such a, such a, um, such a, um, a little girl inside. She always had to be right. If I'm right, then I'm in, then I, then I command the attention and that you have to respect me if I'm right. And I saw her be right. And I was like, right or happy. Okay. And I was thinking about that in my own relationship, like right or happy, right or happy. I have this, I have this, uh, I forgot me as well. 36 different cards and 36 different cards. I use them in my, my presentation. They're just literally I have one word or two words or a picture. They just remind me that in those cards that I can coach anybody out of any situation. And one of those situations is happy or right. Because in personal relationships, business relationships, what do we do? If I want to be right, then that means you're wrong, Pete. So if I prove I'm right, then I'm proving you're wrong. And then Pete goes, wow, I've been proven wrong a lot of times. That sucks. You know what? I'm going to figure out how I could be right too. And then we either fight or we, okay, I was wrong again. I was wrong again. You know, I not even know if you're wrong. You just take that belief on yourself. Like, oh, I guess I was wrong again. I didn't stand up for myself. It's like, no. And for me, I would get into those situations like, okay, I know I'm right, but is this going to matter in five days, five weeks, five months, five years? That is a question I've asked myself so many times, Pete. Is this really going to matter in five minutes? I'll change the fives around. I'm like, is this? No, I don't need to be right. I could be happy. And when I started choosing that, and it wasn't like, of course, it was like, you know, this drug's going to say it's going to cure cancer, but then of course you want to be right. But in the situation like, oh, and this and this and this, then we did this, then we did this, then we did this, then we did this. And like, uh, you can sit there and pick apart every part of their story and say, no, we didn't do that. No, we didn't do that. No, we didn't do that. And basically what you're telling the person that, hey, you're a lousy storyteller. You can't remember shit. Da, 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 da. You're going to invalidate them somehow, some way. You're going to make them, you're not going to make them feel good. That's why they're like, well, it's not my fault how I make them feel. I'm like, yeah, it's, we have contributions that we can make. And so with people I've helped that have had enormous relationship challenges with people, either professionally or, or personally, um, when I just tell them to pump the brakes, I tell them to pump the brakes or push in the clutch. I usually use an auto analogy. I'm like, just pump the brakes the next time you want to be right. And just, just, just choose to be happy. Just choose to let it go. And if it's something that's bothering you in a couple of days, say, hey, you know what? Listen, I remember that conversation the other day. Can I, can I offer my opinion on something? Not in the moment, not when you're emotionally, not when you're going to react. Because another one of the cards says react or respond. That's another thing I saw in my life. I'm like, people who react obviously somebody running towards you with a gun, you want to react. You don't want to go, Hmm, should I respond? Should I ask him what do you have for breakfast or should I fucking run? No, you want to run. Um, but in other situations, uh, even still to this day for me, I'm way better at it. But the other day I was going to do a Facebook post out there and it was very eloquently written. It was very nicely written, but it was really telling, kind of telling some people and their closed mindedness to go have a nice life. You know, I have a poetic way of telling people to go have a nice life. And I was justified. And I was so mad at all these other people saying, well, if you like this, you're stupid. I'm like, I'm just tired of these people blanketing everybody. If you, if you belong to a, a label, then you're stupid. Like really what? And so this eloquent thing, if you sit there and look at people from this aspect, then you might want to go look in the mirror and the person you're calling stupid is probably you and perfect. And I was like, this feels like a reaction. So I tell my, tell my client, pump, I don't need to post this right now. I'm like, here's the test. I'm going to go back to those five people. I'm going to pick two of those people and I'm going to send this to them. And I'm going to say, Hey, do you support me posting this right now? Yes or no. I sent off an email to both my coach and my mentor. One's in New Zealand, one's in Canada. And within less than an hour, I got two responses saying, Oh my God, Chris, don't send that. And I thought it was really nicely worded, but that would have been a reaction. And that reaction would have felt good in the moment, anything to move me in the direction that I wanted to be. People might go, oh, that's the Chris I thought he was or whatever. Oh, that's too bad. I thought he was better than that. Whatever it might've been. Um, but it wasn't that. They were like, Chris, you're, you're coming from a place of anger and frustrations. You're coming from you know, a place that, that you've been to that you're not at now. And that's, that's kind of like the little, mm. I'm like, well, I'm also sick and tired of all this crap. You know, I am to a certain extent, I have a filter on there because I'm not calling everybody a, a dumbass when some people really are. So I have to, I have to stem that a little bit, but they just reminded me like, Chris, be where it is that you're going, be that light. You know, who would you want to see post something right now? Would you want to sound come out and, and post something like that? Or would you want them to say, Hey, hey listen, remember, and we can sit there in, in, in uh, Movember, or we can post something like that. You can post something that can light people up. You know, all this is going to do is going to validate your position in something. It's going to drive a wedge in the sand. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. 
and when I, it was a bigger thing than that, that I was frustrated over. And once I let all of that go, as crazy as it sounds, I felt immensely better. I'm like, cause, but I was getting fired up by somebody who was, who was also frustrated. So I was getting it from a couple of outside sources that I care about. So it was kind of getting poured into me and it was kind of filling that old Chris up a little bit. Like, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. You know, cause people sit there and say, Chris, you have a platform. You could do more stuff with your voice. You could do more stuff with your, with your guests. You could, you could stand up and make us make a, make a statement about some of these things. I'm like, you're right. I could, or I could choose to still try to find the goodness in all people. And I could, I could still, instead of saying, Hey, whether you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, no, I could say, Hey, listen, you know, why don't we be an American? Why don't we sit there and say, what is the best for everybody involved? Let's not have labels. Let's not do that. Let's, let's look at each other more the same than we are different. And, and that was just amazing. So, you know, it's that purpose in your life, that mission in your life of who it is that you want to become, who it is that you respect and admire and living yourself um, daily with that promise. You, I mean, you, you talk about sort of, again, being right or being happy. I mean, are you able to live your truth when potentially you're stamping on your words or you're, you're, you're not letting loose as such. Oh, absolutely. Yes. No, that's, that's, that's a great question, Pete. Um, it is, it's it, honestly, it is frustrating in some aspect that I can't, that I, I shouldn't say I can't, um, that I choose not to do that. Um, because it's still part of my growth. I'm not done growing. I'm still growing. I'm still evolving. I'm still, you know, I still got that portion of that in me. It's not like I just made a decision one day and said, okay, I'm not going to be like that anymore. I'm still human. And it affords me the opportunity to tell people like, yes, you can pump the brakes. Yes, you have a nanosecond before you say something, before you do something, before you think something where you can say, is that gonna serve me? Is that gonna serve the greater good? Um, and also in answer to your question, um, I do get that stuff out. I journal, um, I'll make jokes. Um, I used to have this, uh, this little side project called, are you effing serious? It was just a page, it's a page on Facebook. Nobody knows who it is. And I would just go on there and I would dump stuff. Like I would just come back and I'd be mad. Like for me, my pet peeve was like, if you're going through a crosswalk, let somebody get across the crosswalk before you go through it. And I know in some respects it's petty. I'm not going to go on my personal Facebook page and go crosswalk walkers, but I've just created this, this sarcastic. It's like George Carlin meets Tony Robbins at an ACDC concert and people just laugh about it. So I just go, I haven't done it in a while because I was, it was funny, but I was also noticing that I was focusing on what was negative to make good stories for that. So it's always, I've never promoted it. Just every once in a while, I'll go in there and I'll vent. I'm like, oh, blah, 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 blah. once it's out, I feel good. So, um, yeah, but it's it's also about you know, where is that coming from inside? Where is that part of me that's not healed? Where is that part of me that's feeling victimized or something like that? So it's important for us to recognize those situations and again, do the work, do the healing. Don't do the quick, easy thing and like, oh, I feel so much better. Um, really do the work and heal yourself and figure out where you need to grow from. Did your mother ever get to heal? Um, interesting question. Did she ever get to heal? I think, I think the last month of her life, I think she probably healed as well as she was ever going to heal. My mother smoked cigarettes for most of her life as far as I know. Uh, and when I was a little boy, we had those cigarette commercials coming on saying, you know, smoking kills, smoking kills. I was a little boy. I'm like, we'd have the, the things in school, smoking, smoking, smoking. I'm like, Mom, please don't smoke. Please don't smoke. You know, quit, please quit smoking. You know, it's dunk and everything else. Don't tell me what to do. It's my body, blah, blah. I drive the freeways in Los Angeles with the windows down. And she always thought, you know, if she ever got cancer, that was going to be that. That was going to be the fault, not her own choosing of doing that to herself. And lo and behold, you know, all my life, I was like, mom, please don't smoke, quit smoking. I'll buy you a vape pen, da, 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 da. Tried to do all that. Um, she wound up having a, uh, an ulceration on her lower right um, front part of her uh, th uh, thigh bone or shin bone. And she had this little, little start off as a quarter and then it grew and then it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew. And she started going to the doctor and like, oh, you know, we think, think it's MRSA. It grew to the point where she had to have a femoral by bypass on her leg because her leg was not getting any blood flow down there. So it was not healing. It was not getting any oxygenated blood. Long story short, wound up having an amputation on her leg. Uh, and when she was in the hospital, um, I have pictures of all that, by the way, 
I'm a very graphic person. I took pictures. Her leg looked like it was burnt to a crisp. It had, it had, it had got gangrene. It had got, I don't even know how she managed to stay awake with the way her leg looked. It looked like it was barbecued in a fire. Took her county. I took her to one hospital. They said, we can't even touch that. Took her to UCI Medical Center. Talked with the, the, the top vascular surgeon there. He came inside. You know, we rushed her there. And um, he's like, he pulls me out of the room. He goes, your mother's leg needs to be amputated now. And I'm like, you're not serious. And he's like, yeah. He goes, it could kill her. He goes, that she, she has gangrene in there. It, 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 it'll poison her and it'll kill her. You have to go back in there and tell your mom, we need to do an amputation stat. And I'm around to go back in there and tell my mom, we have to do an amputation. No, no, not my leg. Screaming. Another one. One of the hardest decisions hours whether she finally signed the papers did all that as part of her recovery in the hospital there they did some x-rays and then uh came and got me again and said we found some of these you know we got part of your mom's lungs in this x-ray and we have reason to believe that that might be early stages of cancer I'm like, okay mom just got her leg amputated uh dude i could talk to you for hours for all the different stories it's all, it's all gonna be in the book but um got her leg amputated and I had to go back to her and say, mom, they need to do a needle biopsy on your lung. There's a possibility of lung cancer. I don't have lung cancer. I didn't, no, 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 no. You know, and all, all this other stuff, blah, blah, blah. Stage, was it stage four? It was stage four when it was all said and done. So I had to put her in another assisted living facility because now she had to rehabilitate and start to potentially use a prosthetic limb for her leg. All the meanwhile that she was supposed to start chemo and radiation and she never did and through that process of course she, the cancer spread she had a i had to take her to the hospital one time she had a, a, a metastasized cancer on her back i didn't even know what the hell that was until afterwards it was this giant she had this giant giant growth coming out of the back i have pictures of that too i wouldn't quit smoking i said mom if you quit smoking i'll help you get you know treatment help you get taken care of blah blah never did she wound up in the hospital again, and it was about a month before she passed away. And I had my back to her, and I was getting something out of my backpack. And I had been in so many, in and out of so many hospitals by that time. Um, all I remember her saying is, "Tell Barbara it's not worth it." I was like, "What?" My wife's name's Barbara. I'm like, I think I, I think for the first time in my entire life, I think my mom just just me because my wife had smoked at the time too. Uh, I think she may have just had that realization. Mm. And the first thing I thought was, how sad is that? It, you're, 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 you're going to die. Uh, and you now have the realization that you did this to yourself. And so I turned around and I said, mom, what did you just say? And rather than gloating and going, uh, I just like, what did you just say? And cause I wanted to make sure she didn't mean something. She was very sarcastic, very witty. And she's like, she looked at me and she kind of swallowed her pride a little bit. And she goes, tell Barbara, it's not worth it. I said, we spoke of it. Uh, for that last month, I did everything possible to try to make her happy. She kept asking me when her birthday was. And she wound up dying a few days after her 69th birthday. Uh, the lung cancer wound up getting to her. And I wound up being there, sitting by her side with my wife, holding her hand. My mom and I were not touchy-feely, um, lips kissing, never. Like Harley, we would say, love you. We never say, I love you. We would say, love you. And we would hug. But I sat there and I was just like, and the, 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 the facility called me and they said, you know, your mom's probably not going to make it through the night. And I was the morning, God, uh, God is my, is my truth. Uh, we were moving the next day. So literally I was going to sleep at one o'clock in the morning. We get this phone call. We just barely got everything set. Our friends are coming over at seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning to help us move. I didn't even tell my mom I was moving because I didn't want her to get excited to think that she could come live in our place because our place was now going to be bigger. She always wanted to come live with us and I wouldn't let her come live with us because I had my barriers. I had, you know, I'd already done enough to take care of you. You're going to be taken care of by people. You chose this on yourself. You put yourself in this situation. That was tough. I'm like, then you get to, you get to deal with this. I'm not going to be, that sounds harsh, but I had to do that for myself. I was like, I've already done enough. And so I never told her anything. And so we got the phone call and I was gonna go back to sleep. My wife was like, who's that? And I said, that was the, uh, that was, um, um, I'm trying to remember the place, whatever it was. And, uh, and they said, and I said, well, let's go to bed. I said, we got everybody coming over. She's probably already gone. And she's like, no, we have to go. And it was literally probably 10, 15 minutes up the street. And we went up there and uh, held her hand, wiped her hair away and did the same thing like I did with Bill, which is part of the story I told you about. I got to years after we were divorced. It was an amazing experience. And so I 
selfishly, I didn't want to deal with it, honestly, Pete. But you know what? I'm so glad that my wife made me go. And I'm like, mom, you can let go now. You can, you can, you can let go of all the pain. You can let, this is your time. Don't, I'll be fine. Barbara's here. Everything's gonna be fine. He's like, Samantha, I'm here. Da, 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 da. I mean, she was already hurt. I mean, I touched her hands. Her hands were already cold. So in her, she was going through the process. And um, I was so glad I was with her, watched the monitor, watched her take her, her watched her take her last breath. Um, and it was just like, wow. 133 in the morning, July 31st or August 1st, I can't remember. Um, right on that pinpoint, it was over. All of it was over. All of it was over. Her suffering, her pain, me always waiting. What phone call am I going to get next? What phone call am I going to get next? Somebody's trying to call me while I'm having an interview. Leave me alone. Uh, you know, um, and now it was all over. And so I asked my wife, I said, Can you please let her know? Would please let the front desk know that she's gone? And I walked outside and it was a beautiful night. And I looked out the care facility she was at was up on a hill, like, so I could see my, I could see my house, but I knew where my house was at. And it was beautiful outside. And I was like, wow, my mom just died. Finally, she's over. I don't have to worry about it anymore. You know, she's at peace. It started pouring rain, pouring rain. It was July, right? I had no forecast of rain. In the, and I was like, and just, I just stood there. I had a Jack and Coke in my hand in a, in a, in a, in a six by six flags, magic mountain cup. So I'm like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have Jack with me. And I just sat there and my wife comes out. She's like, why are you standing in the rain? And I'm like, it's her release. It's the release of all the pain and all, all the shit in her life, all the anguish, all the things that she never healed from. She is a source. Everyone called spirit. She's relieved of her, of her, of her obligations as a human. And this is, this is, this is the analogy that I'm going to choose to use that she's at peace now that her spirit, everything is at peace and it's good. And one of that. So healing. Um, I think she did. I think she healed as much as she possibly could in that short amount of time uh, for her birthday. We had her over a week early because we were going to be moving on her birthday. Um, and she was there in a diaper. I had to help her go to the bathroom because she still had the, the missing legs. So I had to put her, pull her pants up, everything. And, uh, and she goes, this is the best birthday ever. And she's literally sitting on my couch, wearing a diaper, having a gin and tonic. Like she could have a small one. That was all she could have because she was on so many pain pills. And I had, I had, I had, st I, had I should say this carefully. I downloaded a movie per my friend's instructions that I could not find anywhere else. She wanted to see hop this cartoon. My mom loved cartoons and I couldn't find it anywhere. So my buddy told me, okay, go on this file server, search for it, download it, blah, blah, blah. So I did that back. She wanted to grill, grilled flat iron steak. And she's like, this is the best birthday ever. I'm like, mom, we've gone to Metallica concerts. We've done other things. We've gone to, I took her to Disneyland for her 60th birthday, um, all this different stuff. And I said, why is this the best birthday ever, mom? And she goes, because you and Barbara care about me and, and I'm here with my dog. I used to have to, oh my God, I used to have to take her dog to my friend's house and bring her, bring her, bring her dog to my house whenever I brought my mom there because she thought the dog lived with me. The dog couldn't live with me. The dog was psychotic. So he lived in a barn, like out with horses. And she never, and uh, so I think she realized the power of family and the power of love and the power of, you know, surrendering to what is inevitable and just be in the moment. And that's one of the, one of the, one of the true places that I found a lot of my social media posts will say hashtag moments. And people ask me, how do I get through things? And how do I, how do I, you know, keep going? Da, 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 and how do I keep my focus in the right spot? I'm like, as long as you're focusing on the moment, if you're focusing on the moment right here and you're giving that moment your best, and that's another thing we talk about, what, what is your best? If you sit there and give yourself the best moment, like if I'm hanging out with my kid, if I'm not playing with my kid, if I'm not being in that moment, I'm I'm not being a great dad. So in this moment, I have 20 moments, 20 minutes, 20 moments. I'm going to make sure I'm the best dad for those 20 minutes. And as long as I am, then those 20 minutes, those moments in my life are great. And then, okay, now I'm going to come up here and do this interview with you. I'm going to be in that moment. I'm going to be in that, that category. Boom. I have this interview with you. We're having a great time. Then I got to be in the moment with the next thing. You know, if you're in your moments and you're being who you are and you're going towards your legacy every single day, life is pretty awesome. It's not without its problems and its complications, but, you know, getting through those situations and realizing they're happening for you and that there's time to, to have sympathy and empathy for what has happened in our life, but to continue always moving forward and where it is that we want to be and living in the honor of those who have passed um, before us. Like I said, Bill, Bill lost his battle 
Um, it, it was, a, it was a sad situation. We actually reconnected way after he got, after I got divorced. And, um, unfortunately it was a little too late. His colon burst. He had tire reticulitis. He had another heart attack. He was in a coma for 20 some days. And I got to be there and hold his hand and tell him, Hey, Bill, listen, I got the girls. I got the girls. I will be there for Tammy, Tiffany, and Beverly for whatever they know you you've, you've been here in your life. And from that point on, I always lived in his honor. I'm like, what would Bill do? How would Bill direct me in the situation? What would Bill say? What would, what would make Bill happy in trying to do those things? Same thing with my mom on her birthday when she would come around. I'm like, not feeling bitter. I'm like, what would I do with my mom today? Oh, we would go to TGI Fridays, you know, we would probably watch, okay, let's do that. Let's live in her honor. What are some things she stood for? Okay, animal cruelty. How can I, you know, can I go make a $250 donation to abused pets on her birthday? You know, and keep those, pe those, those people's positive positive spirits of advocating that was positive in this world and to always honor them is, is, is the magnificent way to, to continue living your legacy. Because for me, Pete, and I'd be interested to know your, your, percep your perspective on this is I feel like whatever I put out, whatever I give out karma, the law of reciprocity, whatever it might be. I mean, we know gravity is a law. If I drop this thing, it's going to drop. I know, and I personally believe if I put good things out in the world and I'm honest about it and I want to make a difference that I know that's going to come back, whether it's my son's health, whether it's opportunities, whether it's meeting great people like you, that's the way I live my life. What do you do? What do you do to make sure that you're and you're, you're giving meaning and purpose to what it is that you're doing? I think for me, it's now it's, it's being of service. You know, I think it's, and it could be, you know, could be listening, could be whatever. I think it's the old allergy, you know, it's, it's what you do when no one's looking. That's the true truth of anyone, you know, and it could be, like I say, it's, it could be a good deed or whatever. And, and this is where, and you mentioned the word ego earlier, you know, the, the, the ego side, which I, I find a fascinating topic and, and, you know, I, I sort of attach, and I, I, I use it for a lot of things, let's just say, you know, and, uh, I think it's, it's when you can live with your ego, you can accept that there's good and bad, that, that, you know, you, for yourself, but really stripping it back and going, okay, why is that significant? You know, to give something is going, who, who saw me who, did, did everyone see me give that you know and you're like okay and that's you know um so it's understanding that right you know so um i think the more now i probably become i probably would call it spiritual you know and i genuinely it's it's through talking to all the people on the podcast you know it's there's, there's only so many people you know you can speak to eventually when they go yep i've discovered that it's not about the money it's not about this it's about source it's about connection it's about energy you know you can get so far with brute force but uh you know yeah. call it midlife call it whatever i think eventually you gotta you gotta change gear and you gotta go actually i can't do what i used to do i gotta do things different you know i need a different formula don't know if that makes sense bravo love it absolutely you know it's all it's about getting out there. i mean what what's your true potential What's my true potential? Whatever I really focus on that I want to make happen. True potential. Uh, my impact, my legacy, my potential is at this point, simple, simple. Uh, I say every day when I get up, I have my intentions and I teach my coaching clients this as well. So my intention, my first intention every single day is to be present and playful with my son. Be present and playful usually is uh, to treat myself with love and respect to treat myself with love and respect, to do things that are fun, to do things that make me smile, to be with people that make me happy, um, to make sure that I'm not punishing myself or anything like that. My third intention usually is to impact the world in some way, whether it's a video I do, a post that I do, a conversation that I have to make people impacted and, and to change their perspective or get them through that day, especially during COVID and everything else. Like I said, I've been doing these free coaching calls. I probably doing about 50 of them. I do them for an hour help people out, have great relationships, you know, keep them connected. If they want to come become a coaching client, they can, some of them have. Uh, so my, my potential now, right now, I think this is one of the greatest times in our lives for resetting. And so that's what I've been doing this whole year is resetting, connecting, you know, getting comfortable with being me outside of the corporate realm, getting that, getting that, that conscious awareness of what it is that I'm going to do next and taking my shows, the Ron Unscripted show. Uh, we just rebranded our Friday night show. I have a, the graphic right here called the Unfiltered Experience. So I have those two shows primarily. Then I do another show every other every two weeks called Rainbows and Real Talk. 
So my is truly unlimited. So I see myself in the future, not far away, actually, within five years, I see myself having some sort of talk show, having some sort of maximum reach show, a Joe Rogan experience, whatever it might be, that I can actually really impact people with what I'm going through now, what I'm continuing to, to kind of go through the tail end of a little bit with the identity and being comfortable with who I am, operating my zone of genius, all of that, packaging it tight and being able to say, okay, listen, ladies and gentlemen, we have gone through this, this, this shit storm of whatever it is. It's really your time to focus on where it is that you're going and having that, having that belief that it is truly unlimited and it's all about whatever where your best is getting up every single day, taking care of myself, being a great example and looking at what that potential is um, moving forward. But honestly, Pete, I'm simple. I mean, as long as I have my health, my family's healthy, I got food on the table, you know, impacting people, that's what I want to do and be remembered for. Your language is very, very kinesthetic. Well, that's what's coming across that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, occasionally when you talk about your mother, you use some uh, sort of visual and auditory, but it's still, you know, is that is that something you consciously do or is that just who you are? That's just who I am. Yeah, I was, I used to be a very, I'm a very visual person still. I was an auditory person for most of my life. Like, and I, and I sit there and I help people with this because I learned again about relationships. Like I worked with somebody who was an extraordinarily visual person. I was a very audio type person. So I would sit there and we had a divider between us. I'm like, hey, Sharon, um, what's going on with the 6,001s? Do we have enough in stock? I need 20 of them for an order tomorrow. She would just like flip out. I'm like, do you have a question? So our boss sent us to this marriage counseling, me and the three of us. And within by lunchtime, we were looking for each other like, oh my God, you're a kinesthetic person. You're an audio, you're a visual. So when I was an audio person talking to the visual person, that wasn't happening. And when I was the audio person talking to the kinesthetic person, I'm like, hey, da, 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 what do you think? And they go, mm. can't you make a decision? I'm like, ah. So yeah, I think there's, I think there's different, there, we're all of those things inside, but I think it's an evolution on how we, how we change. And I think for me now, I'm just more careful with the emotions and trying to determine where they're coming from. But uh, yeah, it's interesting you, you, uh, you caught that. I didn't even think about it. Well, I think I noticed sometimes you refer to yourself as Chris and sometimes you refer to yourself as Christopher. Hmm. Is there... to go back and watch that. Say that again, sorry. So I'll have to go back and watch that. In... Yeah, sometimes it's just shorter and easier to say that. What did your mother call you? Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, get over here. Be quiet. Um, usually it was Chris. I went, I went by Chris for the longest period of time. Then I got a job where there was like a Chris, a crystal, a Christian, a crystal, whatever, every Chris in the book. And they would say, Hey, Chris. And I was there go, what? And it was for the other person. I stood up in front of this big place and I'm like, all right, I'll take Christopher. Anybody, nobody else Christopher. Okay. I'm going to take that one. So I just started referring to myself as Christopher. Hmm. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. What, mm -hmm. um, what's your guilt-free guilty pleasure? My guilt-free guilty pleasure. Hmm. Pleasure is Jack Daniels and music. I, at the end of the week, love my little sip of whiskey, get a little bit of a, get a little bit of a buzz going, get, get my brain to slow down. Cause my brain is like, as you could tell, it's like a thousand miles a minute, like ADD on crack. I told you that before. So a couple of drinks, music, relaxing, chilling. I love it. We're just putting on headphones and listening to music. That has always been the, the, the best place for me to be. And where, where do we see the best part of you then? When, when are you in true flow? Most of the yeah, I mean, uh, I'm in true flow right now, uh, more so than I ever been. It's great, great place to be. Mm -hmm. Enjoy. Do you, are are you now your true self? I mean, have you still are you still working? Are you a, a sort of a working model, or where do you see yourself at? Oh, I think I think always you're going to be working on yourselves. We're going to be working on ourselves. Because our priorities change, they shift, especially when I, when I turned 50, I never had a problem with age before I never, had, but realistically, when I got to 50, I was like, whoa, things shifted like materialistic stuff that I thought was important, not very important anymore. Um, 
which is really re one of the biggest things I'm seeing. Like I'm looking at stuff I saved for my mom. Like, oh, those are her glasses. This is this. I'm like, that's not even her. That wasn't her. That was, I mean, do I really need to hang on to this stuff? Um, so I think as we continue to evolve, those those um, those desires and everything else change about us. So I think it's a, it's an ongoing evolution. I've seen I've seen people. It's about simplification, health impact. It just your 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 priorities become fewer, but your convinc your convictions become stronger. I would hope. Hmm. You know, makes sense. How was, yeah. I mean, the sort of, you talked about this, you know, and the sort of being, becoming yourself and the new and so around the age of 44. I mean, was that midlife crisis slash enough's enough slash, you know, just to, where you were at in your life at that time? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really is. It's, I wouldn't call it a midlife crisis. I would call it more of an awareness and it is that I was doing and putting up with and tolerating <clears throat> versus really having that confidence to make, you know, further tough decisions of what it is that I needed to do for my own happiness. I've always been, you know, wanting to take care of people, wanting to make sure people were happy. And I think that's always going to be something I'm going to work on <clears throat> both personally and professionally. Uh, I've been guilty of caring about my clients more than they care about themselves. So I've had to work on that as well and not want that so much for people. Because at one point I used to call myself a compulsive motivationalist where I was just like, I wanted to help everybody. I'd help the person. I just was like, I wanted to help everybody. And I was like, mm, okay. So I've had to tone that back now, but yeah, it's just, uh, life is just a trip. I just embrace whatever can, whatever's going to come next. I didn't think, um, my tagline before was helping people overcome their self-created crap without the self-help fluffy bullshit. That self-help fluffy stuff is stuff that I've been learning the last couple of years that now I laugh at myself, like talking about spirit and talking about connection and source. I'm like, Wow, Chris, you're gonna to have to change that tagline because now you kind of understand that a little bit more. So yeah, you should always be growing and evolving. And that's 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 my real perspective about life right now. I mean, do people generally get you? You now they do. I think I think so. I think now because I'm not trying to prove it as much. I'm just being me. Like my shows, I don't show up scripted. I don't show up. My show's called Raw and Scripted for that reason. I did not want it. Everybody was like. Oh, you know, you got to do perfect takes for your video podcast. And I was so consumed, like, okay, I just, I talk, I just, I, I let flow from my heart and that was hard for me. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to jump into it. And just being like, like I told you before, sometimes I lose my train of thought. That's just me. Watch my show. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it doesn't. It's okay. Um, so yeah, just showing up and being who you are and being really good with that, like really good with that. Um, is such an amazing spot because again, your vibration bleeds out. So many people who, I had a lady just write me the other day. She's like, she's like, I really love your, your, your content and everything. She was like, I just can't take the swearing. And so I, and she put it publicly and I said, I completely understand, Sarah. I said, I totally understand. I said, I'm not for everybody. I said, thank you for telling me though. I really appreciate it. I said, I wish you well. And I said, Hey, um, I said, listen, thank you so much for telling me. Cause most people won't tell me most people would just defriend me or something like that. And I said, um, you know, I understand, you know, sometimes I use the word shit or whatever I said, but let me tell you about the story. I came off stage and I was on stage in front of about 600 people for, uh, I did a short set that day. I was an MC, but I was also a speaker and I went up there 20 minutes came off and I wasn't, they told me to go up there. Like when I was ready to go to the bathroom and I was like, so I did 20 minutes. I still had to go to the bathroom. I came off stage, people were high five and blah, blah, blah. It was all great. I get to the back door archway. He's like, uh, he goes, Hey, can I have a second of your time, sir? And I'm like, sure. I'm just, and he's like, well, Hey, um, I, uh, I'm here with my 13 year old son. And he goes, I just, I just, I'm not trying to change you. He goes, but I want, I, I want to understand why you felt the need to use profanity on stage. And I was like, Oh, oh what did I say? Cause most of the time I don't swear on stage unless, unless they say it's okay. Um, I actually do have the ability not to swear. And so I was like, what? what? And I said, I'm sorry, sir. I, I apologize. I said, what did I say? And he said, you kept saying kick ass. I said, oh, that's my brand. I said, that's like rad or awesome or exciting or, you know, for me, I wanted, I wanted an energetic word that really just kind of said, okay, it's kick ass, it's fun, it's like electricity, energy. And I said, and he goes, well, again, again, really nice guy. And he says, again, I'm not trying to change you. He says, I'm just trying to understand why you're using that. And you know, I'm on my 13 year old son here. He kept saying that over again. I'm like, 13 year old son, dude, your kid could walk circles around you with swearing. Shut up. And so as bad as I had to go to the bathroom, as bad as I had to go to the bathroom, I was like, you know what? I said, can I just have like one minute of your time to just to listen to something really carefully? And he says, yeah. And I said, I understand that, you know, words that rhyme with truck and words that rhyme with ship um, 
are not for everybody. I said, I've actually proven that if I want in to say, if people don't swear and I say, what the truck is going on with this ship, people still infer that I'm swearing, even though I'm using words that are completely different. They sound the same, but they're inferring that I'm saying, what the fuck is up with this shit? I said, I walk in there. I said, what the truck is up with this shit? ship? Something like that. I always, I was changing around. And I go, you're being clever, huh? I'm like, do you think I'm still swearing? Yeah. You're just being creative about it. I'm like, hmm, no. So I told the guy, I said, listen, I said, words don't have meanings in and of themselves. You can go to a dictionary and get a definition of a, of a word, but really words have meaning. They're based on our own interpretation of situations we've had and experiences we've had in our life. I said, for your profanity, yeah, it's, if you don't want to teach a profanity, you don't want them to, 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 that's totally good. I get that. I said, but here are the words that I'm more concerned with. You're stupid. You're ugly. You're fat. You're gay. You're this, you're that. You're an N word. You're the, the, the. I said, those words have lifetime consequences for the people that get to hear them. So please teach your son about not using those hateful words or using derogative words or using blah, blah, blah. Have them be careful about those words too, because I can say all the profanity I want and you're going to go, okay. And you're going to be fine. You're going to walk off and go, oh, that guy has a foul mouth. I said, you call somebody stupid. You call somebody an idiot who already thinks they're an idiot. And you tell them that one time. And you've been the ones to tell that person he's an idiot. Guess what? You just screwed him over. You just put another nail in the coffin for that person's self-confidence. So really consider that. And he was just like, he was just, I, he just got his ass handed to him. And I wasn't even trying to do it. I'm just like, really? And I said, I said, again, I'm not trying to change you either. I said, but excuse me, I have to go to the bathroom. I said, I'd love to continue this conversation. I said, I'm going to go pee. I went pee for like half an hour, came back and he was gone. I was like, I hope he went and taught his son about that because you know, words really are super important. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's interesting how many people I've coached now. They're like, oh, I can't be myself here. I go to church. I'm like, I don't care if you have kinky sex on Saturday night and you go to church on Sunday. If you go to church and you're a good person and you read the Bible, God thinks you're good. You're having a good time. Don't worry about it. You know, what would they say? Whatever would anybody would say. What, they're going to probably go, oh, wow, she's got a freak flag. I'm jealous. Maybe I should get one too. Okay. Don't worry about what other people thinking. They don't care about you. They're not thinking about you. Live your own life, fly your flag, be a good person, wake up every day, excited about the world and what you can do and how you can make it different and better. That's what you should really focus on. What's some of your favorite words? Favorite words, unstoppable, confident, perhaps, possible intention interesting selection yeah what about yours flow opportunity Permission. Ooh. I don't know where that one came from. Mm. Mm. One. If you would describe your fire in the belly in one or two words, what would it be for you? Passion. That's cool. Look at me, I was like succinct. <laughs> Most people give me like a five minute diatribe and have to remind them I said one or two words. No, that's cool. It's, it's I awesome. listen. Awesome. When's the book coming out? Uh, it will be done by or before the end of May. Uh, I have a lot of words to write and a lot of, a lot of addresses that I still have to check off. So yeah, definitely by, uh, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not, not going to go through a publisher so many different people talk about this so the book should be available next year next summertime around there i would imagine going through editing and everything else so yeah definitely next year it'll be a milestone that's for sure fun times yeah where can people reach out to you follow you track you down stalk you hunt you any of the above they're more than welcome to hunt me down and stalk me. Pete, I really appreciate it. Um, being on your show has just been a fantastic time. I told you in the beginning, I love interesting questions. Your interview style, the conversation has been magnificent. Thank you so much. I've had a blast being on here uh, and just sharing everything. So, so bravo to you.
to you and to show the passion that you're exuding with your branding and everything. I love it. Um, to get a hold of me, just easy, ChristopherRoush.com, R-A-U-S-C-H, ChristopherRoush.com, or they can go to the NoExcusesCoach.com. Um, they could just Google me. I'm all over the place. So uh, yeah, ChristopherRoush.com. And uh, would love to connect with your viewers and um, help them however I can. Final message? Final message. <sighs> so many, so many. Final message. Um, I'm going to keep this one simple too. Be true to who you are and grow that every moment that you're alive within your soul of who you are and who you want to be. Focus on that and be that every moment in your life and you will have truly unstoppable kick-ass success. It worked for me. Beautiful. Like poetry. Yeah. Christopher, it's been emotional. Thank you. <laughs>